Ladies and gentlemen, Excellences, scholars, serving and retired defense officers, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to the second dialogue between the National Maritime Foundation and the International Institute for Migration and Security Research in Bulgaria. <laughs> My name is Ivanka Martinova, and I'm the Vice President of Marketing and Development at the IIMSR. Mr. Satyam Shekhar, the Program Executive of the NMF, and I will be your host for the online conference today. The IIMSR is a European independent nonpartisan scientific and research organization engaged in the most pressing issues in the security and migration domains with dedication to contribute to the national security policymaking through creative, innovative th thinking and focused publication. Ladies and gentlemen, the National Maritime Foundation is India's sole think tank that is focused entirely upon the maritime domain and is the foremost resource center for the development of strategies for the preservation, promotion, pursuit, and protection of India's maritime interests. Our research addresses a wide range of important economic, socio-economic, socio-cultural, scientific, legal, and historical issues, all of which are critical to maritime India. The National Maritime Foundation and the International Institute for Migration and Security Research signed an MOU in the November of 2019 and held their first annual bilateral dialogue on the 13th and 14th of November 2019. This dialogue was organized by the National Maritime Foundation at New Delhi. As we take this dialogue into its second edition and with the COVID-driven COVID uh, global restrictions are still in place, this year's dialogue is being hosted by the IIMSR as a two-day webinar on 22nd and 20. 3rd of February 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start, let me point out some administrative instructions for the conduct conference. In order to maintain a good internet bandwidth and smooth interaction during the event, you are requested to keep your cameras on off mode and only panelists and moderators will keep their videos and audios on. We encourage you to engage in the dialogue by sharing all your comments and questions in the Q&A section, together with the name of the speaker you are addressing them, so the moderators will handle them accordingly. The biodatas of all speakers have been circulated and hence they would not be read out. This will allow us to have more time for presentations and discussions. Over the next two days, we have scheduled three professional sessions along with an opening and a closing session. After each professional session, there will be dedicated time for discussion and audience interaction, which will be led by the moderators of each session. All the sessions in this event will be recorded. With this, I formally announce the commencement of the second NMF IMSR dialogue. First, I invite Commander Dr. Eyal Pinko, the president of IMSR, to deliver his opening remarks. Over you, Commander Pinko. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and good morning. Admiral Sunilamba, Admiral Chuan, Flutila Admiral Professor Magnikarov, Admiral Zev Almog, Colonel Amir Goren, Navy Captain Parmar, dear NMF, Bulgarian Naval Academy, IIMSR team members and guests. It is a great honor and privilege for me to open the second NMF IIMSR dialogue as the new president of the International Institute for Migration and Security Research. For us at the IIMSR and the Bulgarian Naval Academy, the maritime domain takes a central place and we are uh, dedicating ourselves to explore, research and understand the challenges in the maritime domain in the Balkan region. We understand that the Indo-Pak region <clears throat> has a major global impact and also on the EU and the Balkans. The, IAI, the IIMSR sees the importance of collaboration with the NMF for a better understanding of the mutual influence and the perspectives at those two regions. <clears throat> From the first days of history, men tried to conquer and rule sea routes. It was well understood that the one who will rule the waves will rule the global economy, trade, and the land itself. Ruling the seas 
enables humankind to discover new continents, connecting nations, people, commerce, and globalization. More than that, the maritime routes are one of the most important factors in globalization. In a matter of fact, more than 80% of world commerce goes by sea. The development of the maritime routes did not bring only prosperity, new horizons and opportunities, but also brought new security challenges. We can find growing piracy attacks, drugs, weapons, and human smuggling, and maritime terror among them. In the last few decades, missions of navies transformed from classical naval warfare, intelligence operation, and secure, on securing navigation freedom to peacekeeping missions and fighting against asymmetrical actors. This transformation made navies think, train, and process force build up mainly differently. My career in the Israeli Navy started more than 31 years ago, and then was one of the first operational event, events I took part in. It was January 1991. My ship was anchored at the exit from Haifa port, almost midnight. Everything was nearly romantic in the surrounding. Birds flew over the water, the stars were shining up in the sky. I remember myself just looking up there and smiling. But suddenly, a big boom came. An Iraqi missile exploded in the port a few hundred meters from us. One of the officers ran and cut with an axe the anchor, and we just ran into the open sea. From here, we have started three weeks mission at sea near the shores of Lebanon with a mission to secure that no terror attack will come to the Israeli coastline. 15 years later, I found myself standing on INS Hanidek, INS Spear, on a July Saturday morning, nearby the same shore of Lebanon, after the ship got hit by Hezbollah Iranian operatives missile. A few years later, I found the privilege to lead intelligence team that identify and track Iranian weapon smuggling ships. Those events, among hundreds more operation missions I took part in, were for me the cornerstones for understanding the importance of the maritime domain to the sovereignty and prosperity of my country. The second NMF IIMSR dialogue comes after a year that changed humankind, our way of life, our habits of for decades ahead. Those changes will also affect the maritime domain and the challenges of securing the freedom of navigation. In the next two days, we will have a fascinating session in which some of the best international experts will introduce. Those sessions will emphasize on different issues in the maritime domain. From cyber, migration, energy to security and the, and the changing face of naval warfare. I am sure this dialogue will be interesting, fruitful, and mainly thought-provoking. Today's session is not as a replacement uh, for, of our uh, ever-valid invitation to host you, the NMF delegation, for the next dialogue in Bulgaria, whenever it, it becomes possible. Of course, with the uh, prosperity of the COVID-19. I would like to thank you all for your time and participation and especially thank to Mr. Shatyan Shinkar and Ms. Ivanka Martinova for taking care of all the organizational issues for this conference. I want to end my speech with a paragraph taken from the Holy Bible. Your ways at sea, your journey and many waters and your trails are unknown. May God will bless you and protect you all. Thank you very much. Have a pleasant day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Commander Pinko. May I now invite Admiral Sunil Lamba, Chairman of the National Maritime Foundation and the former Chief of the Naval Staff India to deliver his opening remarks. Over to you, Admiral Lamba. Uh, thank you, Anika. Commander Dr. Eyal Pinko, President IIMSR, uh, Flotilla Admiral Beldikrovov, Admiral Zev Among, uh, Admiral uh, Pradeep Chauhan, Director General of NMF, distinguished panelists, speakers, uh, ladies and gentlemen, 
A very good afternoon to all of you from India. It gives me immense honor and pleasure in welcoming each one of you to the second NMF IM, IIMSR dialogue. And we at NMF deeply cherish the growing relationship between our two institutions. Our effort for continued engagement is indicative of a mutual desire to examine areas of common interest, seek avenues of, of cooperation, and suggest inputs to our respective policymakers. I recall the inaugural dialogue conducted by NMF in New Delhi in November 2019 on the theme, Maritime Security Challenges, Sharing Perspectives. The dialogue was well received and provided a strong and stable foundation for the relationship to grow and prosper. In April last year, we had the opportunity of witnessing a well-researched and scintillating online presentation by Dr. Pinko on the topic China's biological warfare and the coronavirus. It is most unfortunate that we could not meet in person in 2020 due to COVID-19 induced travel restriction. Now with the rollout of the vaccine, hopefully travel restrictions would ease in the coming year. And I'm sure that we will to meet in person and exchange views. All that notwithstanding, this two-day webinar will like, all, will, like the inaugural dialogue, cover a wide ambit of issues and bring forth views and ideas which result in significant policy rele relevant recommendation. We are living in a world which is very unique in the past couple of years, especially this year because of the COVID-19 pandemic and the geostatic change and churn which is taking place in the world at large. We are living in very uncertain times. You have a rising China, which is now trying to change the way the world is governed. For our friends from IMSR, I thought that a walk in the region we call the Indo-Pacific would lay the foundation of our discussion, of which the NMF team would be presenting topical aspects of. Today, the term Indo-Pacific has assumed ascendancy in a larger global public debate. And we see many differing views even amongst friendly nations and strategic partners. This region is a vast area, predominantly maritime, and consists of an environment of varying contours that change across the sub-regional areas contained within the Indo-Pacific. The best, the best example I can give are the maritime environments of the Indian Ocean region and of the South China Sea. The region therefore encompasses a plethora of risks, challenges and threats, as well as avenues of cooperation and collaboration. There will of course be convergence, which when identified and analyzed would, would aid building avenues of cooperation. There is however one, growing common approach that has emerged, that of a free, open, and inclusive region founded upon a cooperative and collaborative rule-based order. This approach has a high degree of consensus and acceptability amongst many like-minded nations. India's outlook of the Indo-Pacific can be seen through the lens of the geographical spectrum of the area as espoused by our Honorable Prime Minister from the East Coast of Africa to that of the Western shores of the Americas. Within this spectrum, India's approach is, divine, is defined through the concept of security and growth for all in the region of Sagar, neighborhood first, the Act East policy, and more recently, the Indo-Pacific Ocean Initiative, tabled by the Prime Minister Modi at the East Asia Summit in 2019. The IPOI is an initiative with considerable promise as it's an open global initiative and can draw on the existing regional cooperative architectures and mechanisms to focus on its seven central pillars. These pillars are maritime security, maritime ecology, maritime resources, capacity building and resource sharing, 
disaster risk reduction and management, science, technology, and academic cooperation, and trade connectivity and maritime transport. The Indo-Pacific region has witnessed multiple forms of terrorism in the recent years, and few countries in this part of the world have been spared by the scourge. The global nature of terrorism has further enhanced the threat while parallelly opening doors to a collective effort in combating it. The complexity of the region and increased activity throughout the Indo-Pacific due to expanding regional and global connectivities in terms of trade, ideas, people, and resources has also raised a new set of maritime security challenges. Historical state-based concerns such as geopolitical fragility, internal political upheaval, insurgency, state-related tensions, sea lane security and territorial disputes are now coupled with asymmetric threats from non-state actors and sources. These diverse challenges are exaggerated by diverse set of nations bordering this region. Ranging from prosperous states to developing nations, the, method, the different modes of governance and economic standing also impact the Indo-Pacific. Such is the diversity that straddles Indo-Pacific region and poses significant challenges for the future. This diversity attracts the attention of investments, especially in nations who seek to improve and develop their infrastructure along with its connectivity to the region and beyond. China, through its Belt and Road Initiative, or BRI, as we all call it, is investing in infrastructure in its initiatives across the Indo-Pacific into Europe and Africa. While connectivity is undoubtedly the prime objective or prime aim of the project, it is increasingly clear that China seeks to expand its influence and in doing so has challenged many and existing global standards, especially the established international rule-based system. And we need to look at this aspect closely. On another note, considerable importance needs to be accorded towards developing futuristic technologies. And I'm happy to see that the webinar covers this aspect. The mantra of this day is Atmanivar Bharat, which means a self-reliant India. India has been investing in developing futuristic technologies and aims to achieve self-reliance in defense production. And to progress along this vision, partnerships with like-minded countries would play a key role. We've had a meaningful interaction during the inaugural dialogue, and this continued interaction will add to the richness that comes from a strong, robust relationship. I am sure that the rich deliberation during this dialogue will provide new perspectives, fresh ideas, and meaningful policy relevant recommendation, which in turn will strengthen relationship of both our nations. I look forward to the webinar and wish all the participants all the very best. Uh, take care and stay safe in these difficult times. Thank you and Jane. Thank you very much, sir, for uh, your insightful opening remarks. Uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, uh, delighted to announce the opening of the first professional session in which we will be presented the geostrategic situation from Indo-Pacific and Balkan perspectives, as well as the BRI implications for both regions. The session will be moderated by Major Avner Saar, Vice President at IIMSR. Mr. Saar is expert in crisis negotiations with more than 30 years effective service in finance special operations, field intelligence and reconnaissance units in Israel. During his years of active work, he has been a lead crisis negotiator in evolving and ongoing uh, hostage, terror, and other crisis situations. He is a scholar with expanded research and practical experience in counterterrorism, crisis management, influence, and persuasion, and conflict resolution. Major Sar, the virtual floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon to all uh, the people. Um, namaste, welcome, to all of you. 
to the session number one in our conference. Five great speakers will share with us the wide experience, knowledge, and wisdom regarding the importance of the future geostrategic challenges. We will begin the session with the uh, Vice Admiral Pradeep Shohan, Director General of NMF New Delhi, which is India's foremost resource center for the development and advocacy of strategies for the promotion and protection of India's maritime interest. Our second speaker will be Jordan Bozilov, who carries a wide educational background and experience in the law and political sciences. His professional career includes more than 20 years in different position in the Bulgarian Ministry of Defense. Currently, he is the president of Sofia Security Forum. Our third speaker will be Flotilla Admiral, Professor Boyan Mednikarov, who is director of Nikola Vapsarov Naval Academy, professor of military political aspects of security, chairman of the Scientist Union in Varna, member of the management board of the Bulgarian Union of Scientists and an active public figure. Our fourth speaker will be Professor Siana Lutskanova. Professor Siana Lutskanova teaching career has commenced at the Peace Research Institute in Frankfurt. She was an active participant in the negotiation between Bulgarian and the US government in the field of defense cooperation and holds a great experience in her expertise. Dr. Jabin Jacob will be our fifth speaker and he is an adjunct research fellow in NMF. Jabin T. Jacob is an associate professor at the Department of International Relations and Governor Studies at the Shiv Nadar University in India. and an adjunct research fellow at the National Maritime Foundation in New Delhi. He was formerly fellow and assistant director at the Institute of Chinese Studies and associate editor of the journal China Report. Just a few notes before we continue. Uh, according to the plan, I just want to remind the honorable speakers that we have 20 minutes for uh, the presentation. And about the question, please write uh, the name of the speaker and the question. And uh, I have uh, the honor to welcome Vice Admiral Pradeep Shawan, Director General of NMF. Respectfully, respectfully, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, and. Uh... Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, without further ado, allow me to uh, share my presentation. Um, moving it to full screen. What I'm going to do is uh, launch into an Indian perspective. We have 1.4 billion Indians and there are 1.4 billion uh, perspectives, I think. But uh, mine is going to be one of them of some various, some of the various uh, maritime geo strategies that are in play at the moment in the Indo-Pacific. So I'm not going to give you <clears throat> too much of the basics. I'm going to build upon what we have said last time and then hopefully move on from there onwards. The Indo-Pacific, as uh, Admiral Lamba has already said, <clears throat> remains a predominantly, but not exclusively, of course, maritime expanse and as such, its uh, geographic bounds have been defined once again, as Admiral Lamba just mentioned, extending from uh, the shores of East Africa to the shores of the Americas. And what is important is to understand that uh, for India, India's concept of the Indo-Pacific is a strategic geography. It is not, it is not in and of itself a strategy. And while the Americans are free to have whatever they desire in whatever form they want, for India, this is a strategic geography inside which there are many strategies, but in and of itself, 
the Indo-Pacific does not indicate a strategy. Now, insofar as the extent is concerned, the uh, Indo-Pacific constructs of ASEAN, Japan, France, and Germany coincide with those of India, with that of India, in that they now include the whole region that is shaped by the Indian and the Pacific Oceans. And while um, that of Australia and the USA do not presently go west of India, there is increasing evidence of strategic convergence in their construct. By strategic convergence, I mean that uh, shared interests, uh, of course, are there, but also there is a sense of common interests for purposes and projects which are based upon shared ideas and shared norms. So India's grand strategy within the Indo-Pacific is founded on five Hindi words, all of which start with the sound S and the uh, italicized versions are basically to aid in pronunciation by non Hindi speakers. They are Samman, Samvad, Sayog, Shanti and Samriddhi standing for respect, dialogue, cooperation, peace and prosperity. If you look at the prime minister's speech, uh, I have highlighted in red those elements of that particular extract that are of particular uh, relevance to us. Inclusivity, unity and diversity, pluralism, coexistence, openness, dialogue, peace, respect, commitment to international law, the promotion of democracy and a rules-based international order, open seas, open space, open airways, and open cyberspace, an open economy, and a transparent approach to the entire region. This has been typified, as Admiral Lamba explained, by the uh, vision of SAGAR, which is an acronym standing for security and growth for all in the region, plus the Hindi word for oceans, and it reflects India's in external outreach to the world and to the region in particular, as depicted in this particular, in this uh, specific graphic. So the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative has also been touched upon, and it is designed to create a safe, secure, and stable maritime domain within which collective and collaborative mechanisms could be created to conserve and sustainably use this domain and safeguard the oceans build capacity, share resources fairly, reduce disaster relief and uh, disaster risk, enhance science and technology and academic cooperation, and promote free, fair, and mutually beneficial trade. So it's got seven pillars. They have been touched upon by Admiral Lamba. I will not dwell upon them, except to emphasize the need for connectivity on which I will speak. So India's maritime security within the Indo-Pacific seeks to ensure that India enjoys holistic maritime security. And in common with most governments uh, today, India recognizes full well that there are several dimensions of security of which military security is only one. Arguably, it's the most important one, but nevertheless, it is only one. And maritime security for India implies freedom from threats that arise either in the sea or from the sea or through the sea. And these threats could either be man-made, they could be natural, they could be combinations. And many of you, if not all of you, are very familiar with this typology. Our maritime strategy rests upon two fundamental axioms. The first is drawn from the Constitution of India, and it says that it is to assure the economic, material, and societal well-being of the people of India, and this statement reflects India's core national interest. The second axiom as a maritime nation is that India wishes to use the seas for her own purposes while dissuading or deterring or preventing other people from using the seas in ways that are to India's disadvantage. And the reasons why we want to use the seas in this manner are collectively, of course, India's maritime interests, of which we have nine, and they will they are sequentially being shown on the screen. I will not read them out because they are familiar and we've gone through them in some detail during the first engagement that we had between the NMF and the IIMSR. Of consequence here is the fact that India's maritime interests are India's. 
they are not determined by any other nation and they are not a function of any other nation. In fact, if you, if you, even if you could magically erase China from the face of the earth, it would not change a single maritime interest one bit. Here, I actually tried to erase it, it was great fun, but the point I wanted to make is more serious than that. So now I, let me turn to, since we're talking to a European think tank of some eminence, let me talk to you how we see the European strategies that are at play in the Indo-Pacific. First of all, Europe is an incredibly complicated place. I used to think it's a small continent, uh, and uh, you know, but the more I look at it, the more complicated, the more complex it is. As you can see, uh, first of all, the crush of countries is large, and there are many, many, many overlapping constructs within Europe. Now, I'm going to leave this slide uh, with all of you uh, subsequently as a PDF version, uh, and you can then examine the manner in which Europe has managed to in, in, enmesh itself in so many complementary and in some cases, not so complementary uh, constructs. So you can see that Bulgaria figures almost uniformly in all of them. Uh, it's within the European Union, it's within the uh, Council of Europe. Of course, it's got uh, several elements within the Eurozone, the EU Customs Union, and so on and so forth. And, if, and, and yet there are others in which Bulgaria doesn't figure. So if you look at the European Union alone and uh, just concentrate upon the EU, there again, we have a sharp divide between Western Europe and Eastern Europe or the 17 plus one format. And China is actively engaged, actively engaged in splitting this by concentrating its efforts upon the EU 17 plus one members, leaving the uh, Western European segment alone. Today, I'm not going to talk about that so much as I'm going to speak about the, the major players who are operating within the Indo-Pacific. So for France, which is the major one, the Indo-Pacific constitutes a maritime and land geographical area shaped by interactions around centers of gravity, namely India, China, Southeast Asia, and Australia. And it comprises the Indian and the Pacific Oceans and forms a security continuum spreading from the Eastern African coastline to the Western American seaboard. An important an Indo-Pacific perspective actually comes naturally to France because it is the only European nation with a significant presence in both the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean in territorial terms. So France desires to protect its territories and its overseas citizens. It desires to uphold a rules-based international order that will ensure maritime security and critical trade links, increase arms exports, and curb nuclear proliferation and terrorism. This is a this is a slide showing the uh, showing the uh, drivers of France in the Indo-Pacific, namely basically concentrating upon the trade and the French overseas territories, as I've just explained. France therefore has a robust military presence involving both freedom of navigation operations and regional partnerships as shown on this particular slide. French strategy in the Indo-Pacific envisions a growing role for France in the region, leveraging the linkage of security and climate change while maintaining a strong Asian foothold and sees itself as a mediating, inclusive and stabilizing resident power. France and India have a joint strategic vision of the Indo-Pacific, particularly over the last two years. So France and French forces in the Indian Ocean are the major European pointy end of the European uh, or the EU's sphere, shall we say. France seeks to strengthen the role of the European Union in the Indo-Pacific and increase the EU's visibility and cooperation with ASEAN is seen as key to this endeavor and focuses upon both traditional and non-traditional issues of such as maritime security, cyber security, disaster resilience, and so on. So France's strategy in the Indo-Pacific incorporates amongst other things, the conclusion of a strategic partnership between the EU and ASEAN, admission of the EU to the East Asia summit, and the creation of a European Pacific strategy. Let me turn to Germany, which is the other big player. In Germany, we have the 
light and, light and lean uh, guidelines or the guidelines for uh, operations of Germany in the Indo-Pacific. Germany conceptualizes the Indo-Pacific somewhat differently. It does so as a realm or a space shaped by the Indian and Pacific Oceans and defined by the interplay of geopolitics and geoeconomics by our interlocking competing strategic projections and global value chains. So Germany has eight, eight core interests in the region. One is peace and security to which these, uh, there are six threats, increasing geopolitical tensions, North Korea by name, nuclear weapon program, border disputes, civil conflicts, refugee movements, and terrorist networks. The second core interest of Germany in the Indo-Pacific is the diversification and deepening of relations where Germany seeks to avoid unilateral dependencies and strengthen ties with tomorrow's global players, especially democracies and partners with shared values where the areas of interest and cooperation are trade and investment, development, security, culture, and science. The third core interest of, Germ of Germany in the Indo-Pacific is the promotion of multilateral economic and security structures rather than bipolar ones or outright hegemonic ones. So as to avoid a new cold war with countries that are forced to then choose between two sides. The fourth is to preserve and keep open the shipping routes so as to prevent a negative impact on global supply chains. The fifth core interest of Germany is to make sure that we have that they have open markets and rules based multilateral free trade uh, via the WTO and the EU FTAs with regional partners and here we start to see a divide between uh, Germany's approach and that of India. Uh, where India doesn't have the same degree of confidence in the WTO as Germany professes. The sixth is digital transformation and connectivity based on fair competition, transparency and sustainability and the avoidance of debt traps. And the last two are environmental protection and socially compatible growth. While access to fact-based information is the last but not least of Germany's core interests in the Indo-Pacific. Now, of these, we have Germany has got five guiding norms or five principles. One is the commitment to joint European approaches. The second is the opposition to containment and decoupling strategies. The third is the centrality of ASEAN and ASEAN centric multilateral forums. The fourth is to counteract the rise of bipolar structures. And the fifth is to foster a joint European approach to the Indo-Pacific, where Germany's guidelines form the basis of a future European Union strategy for the Indo-Pacific. And in the partners of choice, Germany has some strange points. One, you, the UN reforms, India and Japan. Climate change, China, India, Australia, Pacific Island states, and Southeast Asia, no quarrel. Cybersecurity, Singapore and South Korea, but nuclear non-proliferation treaty, their partner of choice is China? Wow. What about the other strategies that are in play here? First, you've got ASEAN, where, as I said, there is a strong congruence existing between the functional framework of the Indo-Pacific perspectives of ASEAN's outlook on the Indo-Pacific, that is the AOIP, and India's Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative, that is IPOI. Both have criticality of the maritime domain, uh, an abiding respect for sovereignty, the centrality of ASEAN, the pursuit of peace, stability, and inclusive development as a prerequisite for prosperity, the primacy accorded to inclusiveness, openness, and transparency, rules-based net frameworks, being indispensable and the predominance of dialogue and cooperation. Japan, Japan is another player here. And Japan's strategies actually are concentrated upon two basic corridors. One is the uh, Asia-Africa growth corridor. And the second is, the which, is, which incorporates the Nakala corridor. And then there's the East Africa North-South corridor. Japan concentrates considerably upon the sea lines of communication uh, for Japan. And because she is so heavily energy dependent, this is perfectly understandable. But the bulk of Japanese strategies within the Indo-Pacific 
fall within the Pacific segment of the Indo-Pacific. The US, of course, has a maritime gameplay, which is predominant in the Indo-Pacific. The USA, from our perspective, it is presenting a counter narrative to a sinocentric restructuring of this region. It affords a means to rebalance US foreign security and economic policies towards China, with the major objectives being provide alternatives to the BRI within the Indo-Pacific, secure freedom of navigation within the Indo-Pacific, maintain the existing rules-based order, ensure free, fair, and reciprocal trade, promote quality infrastructure as opposed to merely inexpensive infrastructure through this new and exciting uh, framework called the Blue Dot Network, and of course, promote the centrality of the Quad's arrangement. Australia is the last of the players I wanted to mention. And although Australia didn't coin the term Indo-Pacific, it was the first country to develop, systematize, and popularize the concept. It is the only major power that elaborated an Indo-Pacific doctrine well before President Trump messed it all up. The conceptual perspective is one of space where China's growth is accelerating shifts in relative economic and strategic weight. However, the Indian Ocean has for Australia always had a lower strategic priority than the South Pacific. And this lesser strategic importance uh, had until now generated skepticism about India's capability and the political willingness of New Delhi to balance China. But now India and Australia have signed a comprehensive strategic partnership as well as a joint declaration on a shared vision for maritime cooperation because the depth of the Chinese penetration in the Indian Ocean is no longer capable of being ignored and Australia could no longer afford to exclusively focus on the Pacific, but increasingly had to factor the Indian Ocean in its strategic calculations. So China's, and, the, and, and these were given additional impetus because of China's interference in Australia's domestic affairs, the India-China border crisis of summer of 2020, which, uh, which pushed India into recognizing the need for it to deepen its engagement with middle powers and avoid the polarizing trap of the zero-sum game created by the China-US competition, and yet preserve for India some measure of strategic autonomy. And last but not the least, the COVID-19 crisis and the handling of this crisis by China. So India and Australia. Australia desires to have a strong, both of them have strong economic interdependence with China, wish to manage the rise of China peacefully and cooperatively, desire to insulate themselves from the consequences of China-US rivalry, attach importance to the Indian Ocean as a trade route, emphasize the principles of a rules-based order. But for India, this rules-based order refers primarily to UNCLOS and the IMO. But for Australia, the usage of the term refers more to rules supporting a free and open trading system. And so accordingly, Australia perceives uh, really the end of a US-centered regional order. And it is accordingly exploring network diplomacy to strengthen its collaboration with Indo-Pacific countries other than the USA and China. But India, on the other hand, considers the US withdrawal to be an opportunity or the US decline to be an opportunity to enhance its own prestige by being a net provider of security and shouldering US responsibilities of maintaining order. With the permission I will, uh, of the chair, I will have to take two or three minutes more and just touch upon India. India, her strategy is to protect, preserve, and promote her, ma her national maritime interests. And as you know, strategy is generally governed by Miles' law, where one stands depends upon where one sits. And as far as India is concerned, she sits at the crossroads of the busy international shipping lanes that crisscross the Indian Ocean. And that determines much of India's geopolitical perspective. Every other country, India's strategies are informed by a continuous assessment of present and future risk in the region. And we have seven major risks indicated, one for each day of the week, as I am fond of saying. 
they are now on your screen. Our strategy, India's strategy can be broken up at the strategic level and the level of operational art between the environmental conditions of peace, tension, and conflict. Within peace, we work for constructive engagement and we develop strategies of distraction. With intention, we concentrate upon distraction. And of course, there is conflict. So where constructive engagement is concerned, we think that if we can weave the Indian Ocean region together tightly enough through capacity building and capability enhancement, while promoting value-based diplomacy, China and Pakistan will be denied the strategic space within which to maneuver. As you know, just yesterday, uh, India and Maldives signed an agreement uh, for development of the um, Maldivian Coast Guard Harbor at Uturuti Lafalu or UTF with a $50 million uh, soft loan from India. But it is connectivity that really drives us. Connectivity, if we don't consider connectivity in any single facet in our strategy and it is the cornerstone of our strategy for constructive engagement. Bell, BRI is not the only connectivity model, and I'm sure there will be discussions on this by other speakers. I just wanted to emphasize that there are physical connectivities, trade and transport ones, energy connectivities, digital connectivity, and people-to-people -people connectivity. This is shared between India and ASEAN, where ASEAN has these three pillars of physical connectivity, institutional connectivity, and people-to-people -people connectivity resting upon five strategic focus areas, suitable infra sustainable infrastructure, digital innovation, people mobility, regulatory excellence, and seamless logistics. So where the India Africa, Asia Africa growth corridor is concerned, it's a major one for us, seeking to enhance capacities and skills and build all the four elements that you can see on your screen. This emerged jointly between India and Japan. And amazingly, it is now proceeding more or less on two tracks. One is a joint India-Japan one, and one is an independent one between Japan and India. That means independently, they are moving towards Africa. So as uh, Shinzo Abe, the erstwhile prime minister said, now it is Asia. And now it is also Africa more than anywhere else where you can feel, find the spirit of growth. So the Asia Africa growth corridor is all about maritime connectivities. And in these maritime connectivities, we also have the international north-south transport corridor, which connects India across to Europe. And this will be my last segment, though I have some more, but I think in the interest of time, I will curtail that. Now this north-south transport corridor is of course a corridor connecting multimodal movement of goods from uh, Western India's Western seaboard all the way across to St. Petersburg. But the important point is that when it reaches Astrakhan and when it reaches Azerbaijan, it moves east-west connecting India to Bulgaria, Romania and the countries of Central and Eastern Europe on the, on the west and with Central Asia on the right. And here we will collide with one or more of China's belts. There are major connectivities in terms of the, uh, in terms of BIMSTEC uh, and uh, there, are, uh, there are other forms of connectivity that, that govern the Indian approach really to the Indo-Pacific in terms of its strategic outlook. Last point. This business of distraction, we feel that the USA must continue to operate within the Pacific Ocean so that China's full attention is not yet drawn upon the Indian, Indian Ocean. We are mindful of the manner in which China has been dealing with Europe, and we don't want the same thing to happen by the country, the region, the countries of the region of the Indo-Pacific being split. So China excels in this. What it does is it keeps moving things individually, telling individual countries, talk to us, and then moving that instead of allowing the countries to stitch together as a region. So our strategy will always be to bring like-minded countries together in a collaborative effort to knit the Indo-Pacific together such that we do not offer space 
for China to actually enter. And I'll stop here and uh, take the rest on if there are comments, questions, or answers. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Vice Admiral uh, Pradeep, uh, for your uh, beautiful ability to cover so many subjects, topics, and scopes in such a short time. And uh, the way you have uh, brought it is uh, so nice. It's admirable. Thank you. So much. And uh, as for the questions, uh, Vice Admiral Pradeep, uh, with your permission, we will do it in the end because I'm collecting all the questions. So thank you so much for that. Uh, our second uh, speaker will be Jordan Bozilov, and the stage is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, moderator. Uh, first of all, I'd like to, to thank uh, the organizer for giving me this opportunity to address such an important forum on uh, very important uh, for Europe, and not only for Europe, but for uh, global security issue, namely uh, the developments uh, on, on the Balkans. Uh, actually, we're talking about uh, quite a small territory, about uh, 500,000 square kilometers and the total population of about uh, 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 55 million people. Actually, on, on uh, the territory, as you see on, on the map, uh, on the territory on Balkan Peninsula, uh, six countries' territory lie. Uh, and uh, other seven countries uh, have, uh, have some parts of uh, their territory uh, on the Balkan Peninsula. Um, actually, if, if I, I have to, to um, define uh, the, the, the Balkans, I would say that it's a very dynamic region where internal contradictions and external interests intertwine. Uh, some of these problems are inherited from the past, while others are new for the region uh, and for individual countries. And I'll try to, to, to explain this. The new history of Balkan states uh, dates back to the collapse of the Ottoman Empire at the end of 19th century, uh, when the restoration of nation state started. And unfortunately, this process of building of nation states resulted in many wars, violence, ethnic cleansing, and contradictions between states. This process reflected onto uh, terminology and some perceptions of the Balkans. Uh, one of the most widely spread term in political theory, uh, you probably all know, is Balkanization. And Balkanization uh, means division of a multinational state into smaller ethnically homogeneous entities or ethnic conflicts within multi-ethnic ethnic states. Um, and this term is very widely, uh, widely used in political science. For example, I, uh, I read uh, several years ago about the balkanization of Somalia. Another term which is widely spread today is cyber balkanization or splitting the global internet. We often refer to the Balkans uh, as an apple of discord, wasp's nest, the backyard of Europe, the gray zone of Europe, and obviously, there is a negative connotation related to the Balkans. Uh, of course, the situation today is very different from that of the past uh, uh, decades, uh, uh, when we have uh, when we had uh, interstate and interethnic conflicts on the Balkans, and Balkans were in the center of uh, media uh, over the world. But still, there are many challenges. What what I would say that the most distinct feature for the region today is its Western orientation. All countries are currently member of NATO and European Union or declared that the membership in European Union or NATO is a priority for them, which means adherence of these countries to the Western values and Western way of life. Of course, there are some specifics, uh, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll try to uh, exemplify this uh, further, but this is the, the, the most important feature in the region. Uh, and uh, of course, countries from uh, the Balkans perceive NATO and European Union as organization uh, which, which could guarantee their security and future development. Uh, 
since the breakup of the socialist bloc, Bulgaria, Romania, Croatia and Slovenia became member both of NATO and European Union. Macedonia, Montenegro and Albania have joined NATO and Macedonia, Montenegro, Albania and Serbia are candidates for European Union membership while other two countries, Kosovo and Bosnia and Herzegovina are potential candidates. This shows that the region has a clear orientation towards the Western model of organization of state, of economy, of the place of individual in society, and so on and so forth. On the other hand, the process of enlargement of European Union towards Balkans is not complete. Uh, as six countries uh, from the Western Balkans uh, as are still candidate or potential candidate. There are, there are several reasons uh, for this situation. On one hand, all European member countries have to agree to admit new countries. And on another hand, the candidate countries have to fulfill certain criteria. The European Union, unfortunately, now is a process, I will put in uh, this uh, way, rethinking itself. And it's, uh, frankly speaking, to uh, tired of uh, accepting new members for now. From other side, countries from the Western Balkans do not meet criteria for membership, like rule of law, functioning liberal economy, protection of human rights. Uh, there is a high level of corruption, organized crime, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the European Union and NATO and the individual uh, EU and NATO countries, of course, support the reforms of the Western Balkans uh, in order to meet criteria for future membership. And this makes European Union and NATO and the individual member states the most important and influential players in the region, in all spheres. Uh, in political sphere, in security, economy, military, trade, culture, etc., etc., etc. Of course, European Union is the main, main trade and economic partner and donor of these countries. Uh, having said that EU and NATO are the main players, I have to uh, state that there are many other external players on the Balkan playground. And uh, we observe a strong competition between different actors. The other actor on the Balkans is Russia. Uh, Russia, of course, has several interests in the Balkans. Uh, first, to protect transport routes for its energy resources to Europe, several pipelines uh, passing through, through the Balkans. Second big interest of Russia is to protect uh, its uh, investments, mainly in energy sector, but also in tourism uh, and, and, and other sectors. Third interest of Russia is to pursue its geostrategic interests. Russia perceives NATO as a main threat to its security. So the biggest interest of Russia is to hold NATO's enlargement to new countries and to sow discord between individual NATO and EU member states. And Russia does it uh, on the Balkan territory by various means, mostly by hybrid activities. Uh, it's a propaganda, misinformation, influence through political parties, various non-governmental organizations, interesting also through the Orthodox Church, as uh, uh, Bulgaria, uh, uh, Greece, Romania, Macedonia are Orthodox countries. So Russia uses all methods uh, to, 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 uh, to influence the policies uh, in these countries. Russia has established special relations with Serbia by providing military assistance. There is a Russian center for humanitarian operations on Serbia territory and so on and so on. But what is important, uh, I, I think, Russia is a not, not a model for the countries in the region. Uh, so some countries try to keep good relations with Russia, but are looking to another model of development, namely the, the Western model. Another big player, uh, I would say pretty new and unknown for the region is China. China's main interest is uh, in realizing the new Belt and Road Initiative, uh, mainly through uh, big infrastructure projects. 
uh, it is, uh, of course, in its interest to sell uh, goods and technologies. And the big challenge and big issue here is the construction, of course, of uh, uh, 5G uh, networks. China is also trying to influence politically. And it all, already has been mentioned, the format 17 plus one. Uh, all former socialist countries in Europe, uh, including uh, all Balkan countries, plus China. Uh, actually, this format is not received well by the European Union because uh, through this format, China is trying to impose certain uh, specific relations with this part of, of Europe. Actually, uh, I have to, to mention that uh, there was a um, summit of uh, 70 plus, plus one initiative recently, and some of the uh, countries, uh, European countries, didn't send delegation at high level. So we, we see uh, a signal of uh, rethinking this, this type of, uh, of relations. Um, I, I would say the general perception of China in, in, the, in the region, in the countries of the region, is like a far away benign monster with uh, huge resources and zero disputed issues. But this perception uh, started changing in the recent years. Countries are becoming more cautious in their relations with China and uh, more cautious about Chinese investments. Uh, one example uh, is Montenegro, which has gone bankrupted due to an agreement with China to construct a highway uh, with loans from China and by Chinese companies. Now Montenegro uh, cannot pay uh, the return of this uh, investment. Uh, and it's a huge problem for this country which is, uh, by the way, as I mentioned, member of, of NATO. Both Russia and China try to create very positive attitude about themselves using different means, media, cultural institutions. Uh, for example, China uh, established in the recent years uh, Confucius institutions or culture missions in all uh, Balkan countries. Uh, it is also very interesting to see and analyze how the pandemic issues, Russia and China uh, are rush, uh, rushes to, to offer their vaccines uh, on the Balkans. And by the way, European Union, unfortunately, uh, couldn't uh, 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 include uh, Balkan countries, Western Balkan countries in the supply chain of, of vaccine and, and vaccination, uh, which of course, China and Russia use very well. And I believe that given the new US administration, the recent developments uh, in, relation, um, in relations between European Union and Russia, uh, the, the confrontation between great powers on the Balkans will intensify. Uh, let me turn to another external factor uh, for the Balkans, uh, and uh, this is political Islam. There is a large Muslim uh, population in the Balkans, uh, in the past, it was very secular, uh, I would say. But uh, in, in, the, the, in the last 20 uh, or 30 years, we witnessed processes of entry of much, much more radical forms of, of Islam, uh, mainly from countries from the Middle East uh, and Turkey. And this can be a problem in the long run, uh, because Islam claims to organize society in a certain way, uh, different from the uh, uh, Western secular way of development. Let me go briefly uh, to the main challenges that uh, Western Balkans uh, or individual countries uh, are facing uh, today. Uh, first, and uh, one of the most challenging, uh, it's uh, unresolved problems. There are many bilateral problems, for example, between Sofia and Kos uh, Serbia and Kosovo, Albania and Greece, Bulgaria and Macedonia, uh, there are, of course, internal problems uh, like in Bosnia and Herzegovina and North Macedonia. One of the most challenging issue is the Serbia-Kosovo dispute. Serbia is in no way wants to recognize Kosovo, which split uh, from, uh, from Yugoslavia and from Serbia, as an independent state and insist that uh, uh, the territory of Kosovo is a part of uh, Serbian territory. Of course, the United States uh, and European Union are uh, 
trying for for years to to mediate to find an appropriate solution uh, to this conflict. Even now, there are uh, NATO troops in Kosovo to provide security. But Kosovo itself has many problems. Uh, most notably, the uh, demo, uh, democratic governance uh, or uh, deficiencies uh, in uh, democratic governments, uh, uh, poorly functioning uh, economy, high crime rates, etc., etc., etc. What is what is important to know about the Balkans? Uh, there are no ethnically homogeneous states uh, in in the region, but the idea of uniting all people of one nationality in one state is still alive uh, on the Balkans, uh, which, which to me is a, a powder keg. One of such ideas is to unite, for example, all Albanians under one great Albania. Last year, for example, Albania and Kosovo signed an agreement to eradicate border between the two countries. This was immediately interpreted as a signal of a readiness to implement the idea of uniting all Albanians, which are on the territories of Albania, Kosovo, North Macedonia, and Greece uh, in one country. And uh, of course, any such an attempt would provoke new wars and territorial disputes. I mentioned already North Macedonia. Uh, there are many internal problems in this, in this small country. Uh, again, uh, uh, related to, with the corruption, abuse of power, problems, uh, of course, between Macedonian majority and Albanian minority. I mentioned already Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, this country uh, is difficult to define as a functioning state organization. There are three de facto separate states uh, made up of Serbs, Croats, and Muslim, Muslims. And uh, of course, the contradiction in this country uh, is also a potential source of conflicts. Uh, by the way, European Union forces are deployed uh, in the country to prevent future conflicts. There are also issues which are common for all countries from the Western Balkans. Uh, unemployment, very low wages, corruption, lack of opportunities, uh, uh, which actually push young people uh, from the Balkans to live uh, to to Western European countries, to the United States, or the Gulf, Gulf, Gulf companies. Youth unemployment rates in the region is among the highest in the world. For example, uh, in Albania, it's 28%. And it's uh, if you go uh, from country to country, you, you see the, the increase of uh, the youth unemployment to 55% in Kosovo. So uh, brain drain is a huge, huge problem uh, in the region. Migration uh, is also a challenge uh, for, for the Balkan countries. Are there, there is a so-called Balkan route uh, for migrants, mainly coming from Afghanistan, Syria, Iran, and uh, Iraq. And between 2014 and 2018, hundreds of thousands of migrants passed through the Balkan countries, uh, which of course contributed to the deterioration of the security situation. Um, now well, you can see uh, that the Balkans are full of internal contradictions and difficulties. This is on one hand. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, there is a very strong external, uh, external interest. Um, Balkans, uh, uh, Balkan as a region or individual countries, uh, um, they, they, they have a lot of potentials in, in many spheres. Uh, and this was uh, uh, very visible during the COVID crisis. Uh, when the COVID crisis erupted, we all started thinking about uh, new production lines uh, or uh, new supply chain. So Balkans uh, can, uh, can fill this, uh, the, the, this gap. Uh, and of course, on the other hand, uh, as I said, we have many, many challenges. Uh, Vice Admiral, uh, Pradit uh, Chuhan spoke about different EU countries' approaches to, uh, to the Pacific uh, region. But believe me, uh, there are uh, a lot of difficulties and a lot of uh, differences in uh, EU individual countries' approaches towards the Balkans. Uh, 
for example, uh, Germany is uh, um, much more uh, pro um, uh, enlargement of European Union towards the Western Balkans than, for example, France or the Netherlands. So um, I think that uh, in the past years, much of effort uh, were put to ensure stability and security uh, in the Balkans. Uh, they are on the, their way uh, to join at some point uh, European or Euro-Atlantic um, organizations. Uh, and uh, we have to put more, more efforts not to, uh, to, 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 to leave this, uh, this uh, region into Europe's gray area. This concludes my, my presentation and I'll be glad to, to answer to, to, to the questions. Thank you very um, much. Mr. Bozilov, uh, thank you so much for your uh, beautiful uh, presentation regarding the challenging area of uh, the Balkan. And the way you have uh, put it was uh, very nice to see and uh, your experience was shown through your presentation. Thank you so much. As for the questions, we will uh, give time later on in the discussion, which will be at the 12.40 hour time. Okay? Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, now, please, we shall uh, continue um, um, with the, our third speaker, uh, Flotilla Admiral, Professor Boyan Mednikarov. Uh, please, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Dear Admiral Lamba, dear Vice Admiral Chauhan, dear Colonel Goren, founder of our ISMSR Institute, my dear friend Amir, dear Commander Pinko, President of IMSR Institute, dear colleagues, first of all, I would like to thank the EMSR Institute for inviting Bulgarian Naval Academy to be part in this distinguished event. The second dialogue between the National Maritime Foundation in India and the International Institute for Migration and Security Research in Bulgaria is important forum which provides us with excellent opportunities for exchange, our views, knowledge, expertise on the first sight, very distant regions, but also regions that are actually connected to each other, as we saw from the presentation of the Honorable Admiral Chao Han. The topics that we will discuss on One Belt, One Road, and implications for the European Union are essential for the current security environment in the Black Sea region and to have major effects on security and economic well-being, not only for my country. In our previous meeting last year, I was speaking about One Belt, One Road in the context of the Black Sea as connection point between Central Asia and Central Europe. Now, for this presentation, I would like to invite my colleague, Professor Siana Lutskanova, to present you our analysis on the future effects of the One Belt, One Road initiative on the European Union. Just to add that in the recent years, Professor Lutskanova is working on matters connected with the Black Sea security and European Union security and defense policy. Uh, I am very proud to it her. She, is, she was my PhD student, and now she is one of the leading experts in my academy in this matter. Siana, please. Thank you very much, Professor. Can we all see the presentation? Thank you very much. In fact, every analysis 
of the One Belt, One Road initiative should include the European Union context. The initiative, especially the economic belt, concerns the land network of silk roads linking China to Europe. This is an ambitious goal which can be achieved through increasing cooperation between China and Europe. And next slide, please. Six corridors will complete the new Silk Road. Two of them have European significance. The new Eurasia Land Bridge Economic Corridor, consisting in developing rail transportation between China and Europe through Kazakhstan, Russia, and Belarus. The objective of this corridor is to increase the frequency of rail transportation between China and Europe. And the second one, with European significance, is the China Central Asia West Asia Economic Corridor. This is one of the main axes of the new Silk Road project. It connects the Chinese province of Xinjiang to the Mediterranean Sea through Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Iran, and Turkey. Actually, it follows the ancient Silk Road. This initiative is completed by bilateral cooperation agreements between China and Central Asia states. This corridor aims to better connect all the regional economies to China, but also to Europe, and thus offers a new intercontinental communication network that will open up Central Asian states. This corridor requires the construction of numerous transportation and er energy infrastructures from the Middle East to China. It is supplemented by various measures aiming at increasing trade among all states involved in the initiative. The One Road is the second element of the BRI initiative. The One Road aims to intensify maritime trade between Chinese ports and Europe. This project involves cooperation agreements and investments in Southeast Asia, Indian Ocean, Arabic Peninsula, the Mediterranean Sea, and the East African coastline. The investments made by the Chinese company Costco at the Greek port to Piraeus illustrate the Chinese strategy to revive this sea route. The new Maritime Silk Road aims at modernizing infrastructures and simplifying trade formalities to intensify and accelerate exchange along this route. There are three more bodies to the initiative. Next slide, please. The Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the Silk Road Fund, concentrated on funding investments in the China neighboring countries mainly, and the cultural dimension of exchange through the University Alliance of the Silk Road. The Investment Bank is a Chinese initiative. Although not officially associated, the bank and the BRI initiative are complementary. But it is difficult to identify which projects are associated with the initiative for a number of reasons. From Chinese side, there is no structured program of projects or clearly defined budget allowing ready identification of the investment plans. There is no single branch of the Chinese government responsible for the BRI initiative. And many of the investment projects are sponsored by provincial level governments. Similarly, there are multiple funding sources for BRI related projects, including Chinese financial institutions providing loans and Chinese companies providing equity. Again, this makes it very difficult to identify comprehensive and consistent information across the full range of projects. Next slide, please. There is a recently major policy shift of the European Union policy towards China. To the time now, we have discussed and analyzed the Chinese initiative more or less a single initiative outside from the broad EU context. This weakness was repaired by the Union Union, urged by some bypasses that China uses to enter the European market. It was an urgent answer to the very diversified Chinese strategy in Europe. In the eyes of the Chinese investors, Europe is portioned into three distinct zones, consisting of the West, the South, and the East. 
based on variances in economic wealth, technological advancement, geographic location, and institutional framework. This view drives a very diversified strategy of Chinese investments in Europe, with a focus on capital investments in the core European Union countries, complemented by large infrastructure development projects on its periphery. So the European Union acted, and nowadays we have to include the Chinese initiative in the whole context of the EU-China cooperation, putting an accent on what is important for the European Union based on values and core principles. Next slide, please. Some figures. In Western Europe, the Chinese investors target Europe's strategic assets, strategic research and development networks with the largest and wealthiest European countries, attracting the greatest investment. You can see the United Kingdom, Italy, Germany, France accounted for 75% of Chinese total investment in the European Union market in, for example, these figures are for 2017. In Southern Europe, Chinese companies have leveraged the economic crisis and its consequences to focus on large scale privatization process and post crisis restructuring. In Italy, Chinese uh, foreign direct investments uh, has uh, soared since 2014, approaching 5 billion euros, which corresponds to around 10% of total Chinese investment in the European stock market. China's acquisition of Pirelli, for example, made Italy the top destination of Chinese foreign direct investment in Europe, giving China access to one of the most important car tire manufacturers globally, and an entry into the replacement market, a segment until recently dominated by the major European and Japanese brands. In Greece, the Chinese state-owned enterprise giant Costco Holdings Company acquired a 67% stake in the port of Piraeus, Europe's largest passenger port, with Piraeus now considered China's gateway into Europe. Shipping times for Chinese goods have been shortened by one week. When it comes to the per capita inflows of investment in Europe, for example, Portugal has become the key recipient of uh, Chinese investments with inflows of nearly 9 billion euros. China engaged Portugal in the aftermath of the financial crisis in 2010, investing in a broad range of strategic assets, such as transportation, oil, financial services, insurance, health, real estate. In Central, Southeastern, and South Europe, China is operating the 70 plus one initiative. Another point is the combination with the 3C initiative. 11 out of the 12 3Cs initiative countries are also members of the 17 plus one mechanism that gathers together most of the Eastern and Central European countries in China. Actually, the two initiatives overlap on many different aspects and synergy may emerge from a stronger cooperation between Central Europe and China. China is already financing and constructing some infrastructure in Central Europe, a railway project in Hungary, bridge in Croatia, and the initiative brings together a very diverse group of both AU and non-AU members. Across this region, acquisition prices are lower, demand for preferential lending is high, Human capital is cost effective and concessions for Chinese investors are simplified. Above all, the strategic location is perfect. Central and Eastern Europe map uh, passed ideally to China's main objectives, transportation networks for the Belt and Road and investment goals for further capital expansion across the EU. Uh, however, uh, Chinese investments in the region represents a smaller percentage compared to the core Western European uh, countries. Next slide, please. The very new uh, developments came um, in December last year. After seven years of negotiation, China and the European Union have approved a comprehensive agreement on investment. This agreement is part of the EU-China 2020 Strategic Agenda for Cooperation. This agreement is not a free trade agreement. 
It is still enable European and Chinese companies to increase their investments and therefore facilitate greater economic integration. Uh, the agreement will also have to be approved by the European Parliament and should enter into force uh, by the end of 2022. The main goal is to prevent the fragmentation policy of China investments in Europe. Here is an important uh, note I would like to make. China and Europe are in principle competitors, they are rivals. A China policy that takes systematic rivalry seriously means drawing clear boundaries in certain areas and also deciding against cooperation where this cooperation increases dependencies. The current uh, 5G debate, for example, is a good example of this. Germany, for example, tries to define its own path, consistently European, economically sensible, with a clear view of security issues. The idea of the current AU approach is to make very constructive policy in the context of a principal, principal competition, of, um, in the context of a principal rivalry. The positive with these new steps is that the European Union thinks through the uncomfortable scenarios and listens carefully to how the priorities on the Chinese side are shifting in order to be better prepared. China's climate policy is an uh, example of this. Europe needs China for climate protection, but currently sees little ambition on the part of Beijing to really act. If China wants to be a partner for climate protection, it has to be reflected in actions and not just in declarations. With regard to Belt and Road, for example, we should address very critically the fact that an intensive Chinese coal policy is being promoted in Europe. China continues to be a top financier and exporter of coal technologies internationally, contradicting its promotion of a green belt and road and the climate change goals post Paris Agreement. To date, up to uh, 4.1 gigawatt of coal plants may be built in Europe with the state financing support from China and by China's power generation state-owned enterprises. These companies are fighting each other over environmentally harmful and legally questionable coal projects in Europe. When implementing the low carbon ambition of the Belt and Road Initiative outside its borders, China has an important decision to make and it will be not the easy one. Next point is uh, the um, mentioned European solidarity. Uh, the European solidarity is also absolutely central. It is not enough that the French President Emmanuel Macron took a German minister uh, during his last visit to China. German-French cooperation uh, is not enough in the context of the Belt and Road Initiative. With regard to 17 plus one, it is very important to consider what the, the 17 countries can actually mean to one another. 12 EU member states and five EU candidate countries. At the moment, uh, the entire management of the 70 plus one process is in fact in Chinese hands. The Chinese side sets clear priorities for how money is spent to get their own economy going on again. To build 600,000 5G stations by the end of the year is enormous and could bring China a qualitative advantage in all technologies based on 5G. In Europe, investments should be made in two things at the same time, green economy and digitalization. The question, where should we invest? Which, which jobs do we need to secure? Can become a, a test for Europe. This is also visible in China. In technology policy, it is uh, not only the volume of investments that is relevant, we also need more publicity for conceptual discussions, conceptual discussions between Europe and China. Um, China is working also on its own cyber currency that would allow absolute state control over the economy. That would be a whole new dimension of control according to some members of the higher European bodies, for example. Next slide, please. Europe's market is very open, China's market is not. 
So um, Europe and China can't just meet halfway. That will be a strategic defeat for Europe. Otherwise, issues of dispute should generally not be excluded from high level contacts with the Chinese leadership. For example, the question of repressions, unhuman practices, etc. So that's why we call it a paradigm shift for the European Union policy towards China. Um, vice versa, total Chinese investment in Europe, including mergers and acquisitions and greenfield investments, now amounts to $3,048 billion. And China has acquired more than 350 European companies over the past 10 years. Of course, the share of uh, Chinese FDI in Europe is totally 2.2%, and it remains lower um, in comparison to the United States market leading 38%. Next slide, please. What will be the potential effect of the BRI on European transport? Uh, one broad research using the World Car Cargo Database calculated the scale and nature of the freight flows in the area covered by the, by the initiative, um, the scope for their growth, and the potential impact of the initiative, um, and uh, answers the question if the AU transport system is ready uh, with a view up to uh, 2040. Uh, it should be once again considered that the initiative itself is not a clearly defined program of investment or a statement of the capacity and level of service by air, sea, and rail that will be, it will bring about. Uh, the broad geographical scope of the initiative covering 65 countries means that its effect will not be limited only to trade between Europe and Asia. Future freight flows will be affected by factors such as changes to markets, changes to transport, logistics facilities and services, and capacity constraints. In the mentioned research for the purposes of assessing the European Union readiness for the initiative, it was assumed that the trade between the Far East and the European Union will further grow by 80% until 2040. Um, equivalent to a slower average annual growth. This means that the total two-way traffic will reach around 40 million TU in 2014. The EU's trade with the Far East is now dominated by trade with China, with shipping carriers around 11 million TUs from the Far East to Europe, but only around 5 million TUs from Europe to the Far East. By 2040, the rail may carry 3 million TUs of freight between the Far East and Europe. Uh, and this will primarily use the corridor through Kazakhstan, Russia, and Belarus to carry relatively high value freight to Northern Europe. Less urgent freight remaining on shipping to the Mediterranean may continue further by ship rather than transferring to rail at the first port of call in the EU. So there will be no net change in the use of Mediterranean ports. Uh, to conclude with a couple of words, predicting future of this freight transport is very complicated. There are uncertainties concerning what products will be made, where they will be produced, and how transport operators and logistics companies will organize their service to connect producers with consumers. The EU policy is to be sticking to mutual interest, mutual gain, not on dependencies, especially considering the political, the socioeconomic, and the environmental control of the whole European Union um, transport network. So this is a long way that will affect geostrategic interests with many uncertainties. OK. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your attention. Um, uh, Flotilla Admiral, uh, Professor uh, Boyan Mednikarov and uh, Professor uh, Siana Lutskanova. Thank you so much for giving us a, a deep uh, look into the geostrategic uh, um, aspects and scopes of uh, the area you know very well. It was very interesting. Thank you so much.
we shall continue, please, with uh, Dr. Uh, Jabin Jacob. We are all uh, waiting here to hear your voice. So the stage is yours. Thank you and good luck. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I hope uh, to share my screen in just a second, or I will rely on Satyam to take over in case that doesn't work. Yeah, Satyam, it does not appear as if I can, I can share the screen from here. Could you? Yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, uh, let me uh, start off by saying that it's a real privilege to be part of this exercise, this dialogue with our counterparts from Bulgaria. As I uh, you know, just put out on social media, it's not often that uh, Bulgaria comes across our radar uh, in India, but I think it speaks a great deal to the the wide ranging and global interests of the National Maritime Foundation that this is already the second dialogue uh, with our counterparts uh, with uh, of the IIMSR uh, in Bulgaria. Now much has already been spoken about the BRI uh, and you're almost all completely familiar with the potential military implications or the implications of the BRI in the traditional security domain. And my task has been made, uh, you know, of talking about the BRI and its implications for the Indo-Pacific has been made much easier by the two presentations already by uh, Dr. Bojilov and uh, Dr. Luskanava. Um, what I'm going to try and do is to sort of uh, point out or highlight some of the actual process, the methods of implementation of the BRI, the logic uh, from the Chinese point of view. I, I'm a China specialist, so I'm going to try and explain uh, how the Chinese think about it, what they uh, hope to gain out of it. Uh, and much of what I'm going to point out is actually stuff that is happening openly and visibly, unlike you know things that might happen in the military domain covertly. Um, but it's still uh, much of it. Uh, unfortunately, it's something that national elites um, do not ascribe the same importance to as they would to traditional security issues. Or sometimes they consciously ignore it. And this is particularly true of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, the previous speakers mentioned that, um, you know, at the latest 17 plus one dialogue between China uh, and the Central and Eastern European states, that the level of interest of some countries uh, was considerably lower. Many of them did not send their most high ranking officials to the meeting. And there is this uh, tension or worry about the kind of impact that China will have in terms of its uh, you know, impact on democracy in, in Europe and so on. But these are not concerns usually for uh, states in the Indo-Pacific. Um, and you know, from this presentation, uh, nevertheless, I hope there'll be some implications that uh, our partners from Bulgaria uh, will find for their own country as well as for uh, Bulgaria's neighbors. Um, and these patterns I think are common across uh, the Chinese, uh, across geographies, you know, and, and so, you know, next slide please, Satyam. And my outline for, the, uh, for this presentation is basically, <clears throat> I'm gonna be looking at what is it that the Chinese are trying to sell? What's the toolkit? Who are the actors? What are the specific activities? And of course, finally, what are the implications? Next, please. Next, please, yeah. So the sales pitch is essentially this, that you know, China is a country with a long civilization. It was in decline for some time, but now it's back and that it deserves to be back. It deserves to be now acknowledged because it's simply, uh, well, the largest, most populous country in the world. It used to be a great power in the past and that uh, blip is now over. It is uh, deserves to be a great power again. And of course, it is a rising, uh, in addition to being one of the world's top economies, uh, as well as a big contributor to global economic growth and development, uh, it has, increase political leverage uh, as well. Next slide, please. 
Uh, and what the Chinese are trying to sell is, of course, that they are different from the West, that they have a model that works better than the Western model. So on the one hand, if there is a crisis like COVID, uh, you know, Chinese are able to build a hospital in 10 days. You know, they have the capacity, they have the manpower, and uh, they like to claim the discipline and this will of both and the unity between the state and the people that allow them to actually uh, achieve massive, extraordinary tasks at extraordinary speed. Uh, and Xi Jinping himself is portrayed, uh, this leader of China is portrayed as somebody who is a thinker, who's a philosopher, who is now putting out a new model of development for the world, and who's also a doer. I mean, this, this cartoon that you see is about Xi Jinping destroying corruption or the black gangs in China, All right? Uh, never mind the fact that nobody, uh, you know, and this, this governance model is only shown as achieving results. It is not shown as something that actually created the problems in the first place. Next slide, please. Uh, and so what you have is this packaging. How is all of this sold? You have uh, those of you who have met with Chinese delegations will inevitably have received a copy of the governance of China, a book of Xi Jinping speeches, or now another uh, packaging called the thoughts of Xi Jinping essentially as some sort of a counter to, you know, you could say anybody else's holy books or democratic constitutions that this is a Chinese model that is being sold now as a Chinese dream. Xi Jinping is selling a chung Mong or a Chinese dream to his uh, own people. I mean, which is of the great uh, national rejuvenation of the Chinese people, but which is packaged externally as the Chinese dream of uh, Chinese development model, a Chinese political model that the rest of the world can adopt. And this is seen often now in language that uh, China has adopted in many respects from the Imperial Japan, which is to say that Asia is for Asians, that countries like the United States or Europe are actually, or countries of Europe are actually external powers to the region. And that China, even as it uh, seeks uh, a multipolar global order, in practice is essentially uh, looking at a unipolar Asia, establishing its dominion over Asia first before it actually spreads wings further outside uh, in terms of establishing do domination. But for the moment, through the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, China is trying to create the impression that it has something to offer and that it is a partner in development for all these countries. Uh, next slide, please. What is often in ignored is that you know the Chinese economy isn't as strong or solidly uh, founded as uh, they would like you to believe. Uh, China's internal challenges are huge. Uh, its internal debt is huge. There's a great deal of inequality, income inequality uh, between individuals, of course, as well as different parts of China. And like I said before, uh, you know questions about how China is a great combater of corruption does not address uh, the original sin, which is how did China come to be so corrupt in the first place? Now, I'm not saying that uh, China is the only corrupt country in the world, but it is a point of fact that uh, corruption is a serious issue there. And similarly, you know, while China might build you know, thousand bed hospitals overnight, how did China actually allow the pandemic to get out of hand? What is the governance uh, model that led to this cover up and the ignoring of this uh, crisis at the, in the early stages? So these questions are often comfortably sidelined and you see a kind of wolf warrior diplomacy, uh, you know, China's vaccine diplomacy or mass diplomacy as methods of covering it up. And the Belt and Road Initiative has actually provided the uh, larger framework as well as the capacity to react quickly to crises. And to that extent, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative has been a great uh, achievement for the Chinese. Next slide, please. So uh, what is the toolkit? The toolkit is fairly simple. Money, lots of money. Uh, the previous speakers referred to the kind of investments the Chinese are engaged in. And I think it's a very important point that Dr. Luz Canova uh, mentioned that China is very careful about its, in, about its investments. It has actually 
priority areas that it invests in. Uh, and it's a lot of its investments are actually going to the developed world. And in the developing world, it's an entirely different kind of investment uh, that goes in, usually into brownfield uh, technologies or brownfield areas, uh, as well as raw materials, uh, and often in old technologies. I mean, despite its proclaimed commitment to uh, climate mitigation efforts, in the BRI countries, it's often been accused of uh, exporting old technologies. For example, in Pakistan, you know, coal is still uh, the major chunk of China's energy projects. Uh, of course, China still creates the impression that it is a tech powerhouse. So made in China products are a big, big part of China's Belt and Road Initiative, which is to sell not just uh, you know not just export china's overcapacity abroad but also create markets for chinese products and in that sense again one has to give credit where credit is due the chinese have been investing in or trying to make inroads in difficult areas especially in africa in underdeveloped economies in asia where the western countries are not in interested alongside china has also developed a set of technologies that attract the attention of authoritarian states or authoritarian leaders, facial recognition, for example, something that is was meant for benign purposes or uh, to smoothen communication or you know infrastructure or logistics has now been used as a tool of political oppression. And uh, China is a major supporter of the Great Firewall in countries as distant as Ecuador and uh, Iran. So that toolkit. As a is a multi-layer toolkit which allows for multiple options or uses uh, that China can put the Belt and Road Initiative to. Next, please. Who are the actors? Uh, State-owned enterprises are a big, big player, and therefore one often forgets that uh, the Chinese state subsidizes a great deal of its activities of the activities of their enterprises uh, in, when it comes to for other countries, and uh, which is why it helps uh, them to get contracts and so on, much faster and much lower rates than uh, you know, countries or co companies from other countries. Next. Uh, the other actors are, of course, the diplomatic agencies. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs, of course, is, a, is natural an actor, but also uh, the Confucius Institutes, also party organizations such as the United Front Work Department, which, uh, you know, is, uh, which is a strange and important uh, well, body as far as foreigners are concerned, strange, but it's important because it is now supplying a lot of China's ambassadors uh, to the outside world, including in India's own neighborhood. Uh, next, please. In fact, uh, I wanted to bring uh, Bulgaria into this picture somehow. This gentleman that you see is uh, Ambassador Chang Suo, who was an ambassador from the United Front Work Department, which is to say that he's not a professional Chinese diplomat, but a party official who was ambassador to Bangladesh uh, before he became ambassador to North Macedonia. And what is the importance of this uh, person or this kind of an organization? Uh, I will show in the next slide, please. So uh, somebody from this organization is much, much more powerful than any Ministry of Foreign Affairs official. In the Chinese hierarchy, the UFWD ranks, the PLA, UFWD rank much higher than the foreign ministry. So if somebody from this um, uh, organ is sent as an ambassador to another country, he in a sense has a lot more power to do what he wants and to actually carry out the goals of the Communist Party, uh, which is to say regime interests rather than national interests, you know? so. When we deal with the Chinese, we have to be conscious that their interpretation of national interests is not in the same uh, framework as we would interpret our national interests. So Jiang Suo, uh, in a Muslim country like Bangladesh, was courting uh, the small Buddhist minority in Bangladesh. As ambassador, he was also, it's very important to note, uh, why uh, Buddhist? Because China is trying to be the leader of the Buddhist world in opposition to India, trying to undercut India's dominant role or the Dalai Lama's dominant role in this uh, respect. Also, it's very important that for Chinese uh, embassy officials, the first order of importance is often to keep an eye on their own citizens in foreign countries. 
So the Confucius Institutes, uh, the Overseas Association of Chinese Businessmen, et cetera, they're all controlled. They're all um, sort of directed by the uh, Chinese embassy or officials of the party that are stationed within the Chinese embassy. So, I mean, from Bulgaria, I suppose you could pay greater attention to what uh, this gentleman is doing in North Macedonia, given that this is your neighbor. Uh, next, please. Uh, so, of course, India's or uh, uh, China's power in this particular uh, endeavor comes from its economic might. But that economic might is also the result of China's investment in international organizations. It has been part of old international organizations, but it's also created new international organizations of its own, uh, such as the AIB, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Uh, it has led the RCEP negotiations uh, and TPP is still not anywhere on the horizon. And is of course the largest trading partner for many, many countries around the world, not just in the Indo-Pacific. Next, please. And it has very unique methods of getting its point of view across or in approaching. I mean, we know 17 plus one, but before 17 plus one, uh, the Chinese have been experimenting, have been trying out multiple uh, forums such as the China Arab States Expo, the China ASEAN Forum, the China South Asia uh, Business Forum and China South Asia Think Tank Forum. So multiple levels in which through the BRI, uh, China is reaching out to different groups, interest groups in other countries, not just the political elite, but the business elite, the intellectuals, uh, students, and so on. Next, please. And, you know, in Asian countries, you will see that often there's one big leader uh, and, you know, this person matters the most. Now in China too, of course, Xi Jinping is the most important leader, but China's Politburo Standing Committee uh, China's defense minister, they are also important players. And because of China's, the size of China's economy, they have plenty of money at their command. And when they, they also take the burden of traveling abroad. And, you know, it is not only dependent on Xi Jinping or Li Keqiang, the premier, but other Chinese leaders, military officials, party officials are constantly traveling the world, uh, following up on visits by the top leaders. So this follow up is something that is very, very important in the Chinese process and system. Next, please. And of course, China uses tourism strategically. This is a photograph of a wedding of Hong Kong actors in Bhutan. China offers most favored nation uh, status to many countries uh, and uses tourism strategically in countries like Maldives, uh, in Bhutan, in Sri Lanka as a way of uh, ensuring its influence. It gets involved in pet projects of political leaders, such as the Hambon Toda project for the then uh, Sri Lankan president. It also gets involved in um, trying to mediate between countries, like it does between Bangladesh and Myanmar over the Rohingya issue. Uh, next, please. What are the implications? Of course, China wants to sell its political model. And you have this photograph of this lady um, from Nepal, the Chinese ambassador there where another of China's Communist Party departments, the International Liaison Department has been holding training sessions for the Communist Party of Nepal on Xi Jinping thought. Uh, the issue of standards has been mentioned, 5G. I mean, the idea of Chinese technology going everywhere is to essentially ensure Chinese standards are implemented in those countries and therefore blocks the path for Western or other technologies from getting into those countries. And of course, the political goal of ensuring that Taiwan is removed as an international player, as an international actor. Um, and you know, since Xi Jinping came to power, Taiwan's number of diplomatic allies has been coming down constantly. Next, please. Uh, of course, there is pushback. Gwadar in Pakistan is a fenced off area which has led to much um, dissatisfaction among the local Baluchi population. The Hampuntota uh, port agreement resulted in a 99 year lease to the Chinese, which has been protested again or opposed by local people, including Buddhist monks in, in uh, Sri Lanka. In East Africa, in Kenya, the standard gauge railway project has run into several problems, uh, several uh, issues about uh, debt sustainability, uh, which is now a scandal or a bit of an issue, a political issue in Kenya. Next. Uh, 
technology has already been referred to chinese apps chinese standards you know there is no, what is a private company in china there is no such thing as a private company in china if you go by what jack ma's experience with his ipo is the fact that uh, the chinese state has put in so much effort to defend uh, the china, huawei cfo in canada even to the extent of kidnapping and detaining illegally two canadian citizens for over two years shows the extent of with which uh, uh, you know chinese private companies are linked entirely or beholden to their government next please uh finally it's important uh, to remember that china's objective in indo pacific through the bri is to rival to undermine other challengers india japan the united states so china finds its way around so in myanmar now after the coup the fact is the chinese are now in opposition not just against the united states but to the us to japan and to india right iran is essentially about finding uh, a space that the united states doesn't have in iran and of course it uses north korea as some sort of a card to keep uh, countries such as japan south korea and uh, the united states on tent hooks now north korea is not much of a part of the bri but iran and myanmar certainly are and uh, you know it's important to note that um, you know issues of values and core principles there's no such thing that the chinese uh, care about if those values are going to be western values or democratic values for them it's, it's essential important to undermine Uh, western values uh, democratic principles because that's also a goal of the bri uh, and it will leverage whatever it will use whatever leverage it has uh, in, to achieve these uh, goals so one final issue is you know whether discussions with china matter does engagement with china matter and here i would uh, refer you back to remind you of what uh, admiral chohan pointed out of germany's difficult or rather strange position on china i think if we believe that engagement is a way to go forward with china we assume this from our own logic but that's not the logic that applies to china and the more we engage with our understanding that this is regime interest and that this regime in china considers um democracies everywhere as a threat to its existence the existence of the communist party of china without that knowledge if we start engaging with the chinese then we have a problem on our hands we are essentially limiting ourselves and creating problems for our, ourselves so the bri is not just an economic or infrastructure project it's a political project it's a uh, nobody likes to claim that it's a grand strategy project but it is the closest thing to a grand strategy that the chinese have and that we need to acknowledge thank you very much um um dr jacob thank you so much uh, for your words and your clear review uh, about uh, the scopes that you have uh, mentioned. Um, thank you for letting us understand uh, better the, the, the steps and the stages and the, the view and the ideology of uh, uh, China and uh, what uh, the, the way they act. Thank you so much uh, for that. And uh, first of all, I want to thank all the speakers uh, until now. And uh, we will go at uh, this stage to our discussion. And um, I will moderate that with the first uh, question to uh, Vice Admiral uh, Pradeep, please. The question is, how do you think that during the Biden administration, the US will operate in the region? Thank you very much. I think that the answer there was, uh, is, first of all, the question emanates from a deep degree of um, uncertainty uh, that after the new Biden administration has come, will the Trump administration's uh, various formulations, including the Quad, simply fall by the wayside. And since we had the first, uh, the third virtual meeting, this, the third meeting, this one was virtual between the ministers, the foreign ministers of uh, the four quad countries on the 18th of February. Uh, I think that that is a fairly substantial uh, indicator that the American Biden administration is not uncommitted to the Indo-Pacific. Now, 
The question is whether the American Biden administration will be able to arrest the what is perceived to be a steady decline in American power in the in the uh, Indo-Pacific, as witness, uh, as I said, is a view that is alarming Australia and not alarming India quite as much, is to be seen. I know that uh, President Trump enjoyed unprecedented popularity in Israel, uh, but uh, there was there were a certain number of inconsistencies in his approach and it made it difficult for other countries to have a long-term understanding of where the Americans are actually going with their projects, particularly with regard to China. So I think that the Biden administration has taken the first step to give a strategic signal of, of considerable importance by in the first month of the administration's uh, uh, assuming office, for having this particular quad meeting right up there. Now the quad is therefore being seen increasingly even by those who, dis who agreed with China's initial dismissal that it is nothing more than ocean wave froth and it will dissipate quite as easily that the four countries are actually moving the quad as a strategic or a geostrategic level and not simply as a as a tactical or even an operational level activity. So personally, I think that the Biden administration's involvement in the Indo-Pacific vis-a-vis China is going to be uh, more steady than might have been apprehended by some. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, with your permission, uh, Vice Admiral Pradeep, uh, we have another question for you. Uh, how do you think the Arctic route will influence the region? Okay, this is a question which is asked innumerable times and has gained a lot of traction and it's un I cannot understand why. The Northern Sea route is shorter than the Southern Sea route only up to the only north of, uh, of Shanghai. It is only countries that are north of that that can benefit at all. That's point number one. So in terms of the saving of distance, it neither affects Southern Chinese ports, nor does it affect any of the Southeast Asian ports, nor does it affect India or any South Asian port. Insofar as distance is concerned. Insofar as shipping is concerned, it's even more confusing because in Europe, Germany is the only one of China's top 10 trading partners. And therefore, the, um, what this particular trade route opening will do for overall trade is unclear. In any case, the Arctic route as it currently stands will remain nothing to do with the ice, but it will remain a shallow water route for the northern portions of it. And hence, large vessels, which are 21,000 TEU container ships, et cetera, will simply be unable to use this route. That leaves us with energy. And the energy movement from the Arctic to China is mostly affected by the ESP, that is the Eastern Siberian Pacific Ocean Pipeline and its branch down from uh, down to uh, Daqing in China. But since the Chinese uh, import of crude oil is now an incredible, almost 11 million barrels of oil per day, I cannot imagine that the ESPO is able to contribute more than about approximately 4.5% of China's current level of imports of oil. So the Northern Sea route Will how, will the, how does the sea route actually work? This is something for practitioners to understand that a sea route works not just by distance and also not just by depth, but there are logistic points along the way. An entire port development has to occur. So will ports in Northern Japan benefit from the Northern Sea Route? Yep, will, and Japan will because it, Japan has a great deal of trade with Europe. 
Will South Korea benefit? Yes. Will northern ports in China benefit? Mm -hmm. Difficult to make out because there are not many northern ports in China. And also because north of the Yangtze Yang River, the coastal hydrology of the Chinese coast changes. Here, it becomes shallower, muddier, more, more frequent dredging is required as compared to ports south of the Yangtze Yang, Yang where the ports are deeper, rockier. So nothing is indicating to me that the northern sea routes opening, which I don't doubt, is going to be a game changer for any country other than for Japan and South Korea and China in that order. And for China, it will be limited only to gas supplies by ship. Now, Chinese gas supplies are not going to continue to come from Russia by ship. Oil supplies that will come from Russia aren't able to negotiate in terms of the VLCC movement of ships cannot be moved on the Northern Sea Road. So I don't personally buy into all the excessive hype. Excessive is my adjective. Hype uh, uh, surrounding this Northern Sea Road. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vice Admiral Pradeep. Uh, we have a question for uh, Jordan, please. Can you hear us? Yeah, sure. Uh, how do you see the Turkey's involvement in the region, please? Uh, it's a it's a difficult. Uh, question. Just a little remark. Uh, my wife is Turkish, so be careful. <laughs> I will. I will. Uh, actually, it's a very an easy uh, an easy question uh, about Turkey. Of course, we all see uh, what happened uh, in 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 Turkey. Uh, we all see disputes between uh, America and Turkey on many, many issues. But what is important to keep in mind, uh, Turkey is a NATO member. Turkey is an important NATO member, first of all, uh, because all decisions in NATO are taken by unanimity. So you cannot avoid or, or just push aside to one of the member states. So in order to uh, be functional, NATO needs all its members. Uh, of course, consensus of all members. Second, it's, uh, uh, Turkey is in a very important region, close to very important uh, for NATO, NATO regions. So uh, uh, th there are different approaches uh, to Turkey by, by different countries. And, and don't forget, Turkey is a candidate of European Union. Still, since uh, 70s, Turkey is negotiating uh, membership of in, in European Union, although I don't think uh, it will happen uh, pretty soon, uh, having in mind all the developments uh, in Turkey uh, itself. The second, the second big issue, uh, there, there, uh, there is uh, a big uh, Muslim population in many countries, in Balkans and in uh, uh, European countries. So Turkey very well uses this, uh, this leverage. The Turkey is using a Muslim population uh, uh, to, to, to promote its uh, activities and policies. And third, very important issue, Turkey is a gateway for migration uh, to, 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 to Europe, or one of the, 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 the major uh, Channels. ways and gate, gateways uh, uh, for, for migrants uh, to, to Europe. And the biggest challenge currently uh, for Europe is, uh, is uh, probably migration or one of the biggest challenges. So uh, Europe somehow needs uh, uh, Turkey to, to cope uh, with all these issues. And uh, having in mind uh, what, what I said, uh, it's a very, uh, very complicated uh, policy towards, uh, towards Turkey. Good, uh, with your permission, um... I will ask you another question. How do you perceive the European attempts to keep the flow of work-related migration from the Balkans? Since countries like Britain, Germany, and France perceive the Balkan region as less developed compared to the rest of Europe. Please. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, it is a fact that uh, Balkan region uh, uh, is uh, least developed uh, region in, uh, in um, in uh, Europe. But what is, what is important? Uh, Europe, Europe and European Union is trying to uh, elaborate a unified approach uh, towards migration. And all factors are important. 
uh, as I said, Turkey is important as a gateway. Uh, other countries, uh, which are mainly transit routes, because we have to, to know that uh, migrants, they simply pass through Balkan countries. It's uh, just, uh, you know, uh, Balkan girls are on the way. But uh, having, uh, having all this big migration wave, we, we need all elements, I mean, uh, to, to, to cope with, uh, with uh, migration, all elements, like stopping at the borders or uh, keeping at uh, the countries where they resign or they, 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 they rest, providing support to these countries to cope uh, with, with the challenges. Because uh, as you mentioned, Balkan countries are relatively poor, but there are a lot of migrants on their territories. And you know this is quite a burden on, uh, on them. So it is, again, very important to have a unified uh, policy uh, because still there are disputes with major European countries how to tackle the migration, what to do with the migrants, how to resettle them, uh, them uh, in different countries because uh, the most, uh, uh, the, the biggest wave are towards Germany uh, or, or Nordic countries. So it is, it is still uh, a matter of, uh, uh, of creating a comprehensive uh, approach uh, within European Union. Um, okay, thank you so much uh, for your answers. Uh, just uh, another uh, short question to uh, Jabin. Do you think the US or the EU or even Russia will initiate counter BRI projects apart from the existi existing ones? Well, I don't think uh, the Russians have the capacity yet, um, and I don't think the Europeans have the will. Uh, let me be blunt. Uh, the Americans have the capacity and the will, and uh, you know you should remember that the new Silk Road, the first, the original new Silk Road, was actually started by the Americans uh, with the focus on Afghanistan. Uh, but you know. At the moment, nobody uh, within the United States system also thinks that uh, they need to counter like for like uh, the Chinese uh, BRI. Uh, in India also, we have this problem and I think that's a mistake. We need to be able to counter China along multiple fronts simultaneously. If China is providing infrastructure, India and other countries also need to be able to provide infrastructure plus uh, you know, other goals. Having said that, um, I think the first order of business perhaps given limited capacity or limited financial resources is to be able to support other countries that receive BRI investments uh, are the target of BRI to support legislative accountability operations in those countries to help legislatures and uh, uh, you know, other uh, uh, interest groups in those countries to see how the BRI operates, to hold BRI projects to account, to hold to ensure that BRI projects follow environmental standards and so on. I think that is well within the capacity of Europe, the United States, or India. But it hasn't gotten that far yet, unfortunately. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Jacob. And just uh, one question, please, uh, the last one. And it's to uh, Professor and uh, Admiral Mednikarov and uh, uh, please, the question is regarding the Bulgarian access to the Black Sea, what could be the main threats? What is the definition of the main threats or threat to Bulgaria regarding uh, the access to the Black Sea? Thank you for the question. Actually, uh, trying to answer this question, I want to say that in fact, uh, we don't have, uh, uh, how to say, clear answer. Uh, I think that nowadays there are not real threats, but uh, there are a lot of uh, risks and challenges connected with Black Sea. Uh, maybe the, the most, uh, the strongest of them is uh, the race of the naval power, the naval potential of the Russian Federation. But this is, uh, how to say, uh, 
process which engaged not only Bulgaria, engaged uh, other Black Sea countries. Uh, you know about the problems between the Russian Federation and Ukraine, and Georgia. And uh, you, might, you know that one of the main focus of the uh, NATO, European Union, but mainly NATO is to uh, to keep the balance. And nowadays we have a lot of naval activities uh, in Black Sea connected to its uh, participation of uh, uh, US Navy and some, not, um, and, uh, some other Western navies. Uh, so, um, of course, we have uh, problems with uh, the ecology of the Black Sea. Uh, we have uh, potential problems with migration. Thanks God, till now, uh, the migration is not so active. Uh, using the, the sea, sea waves in Black Sea, are not so, they are not so used for the purposes of migration. Uh, we have uh, some troubles with uh, illegal traffic of... Uh, drugs of uh, some weapons but uh, for our from our point of view maybe uh, the main problem is the 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 race of the military potential uh, speaking about russian federation actually not only navy but uh, the uh, the air force the uh, the land forces uh, uh, and of course, uh, the crisis, the, these two main crises, the first one, the biggest one in Ukraine, the second one connected with uh, the north part of uh, Georgia. Uh, actually, uh, I want to, to make a short comment for uh, the position of the Dr. Jacob. Uh, our understanding is that uh, Maybe United States uh, have interests. Uh, United States, they have interest to, to, to make some obstacles for One Belt, One Road initiative. For me, uh, one of the main purposes of this initiative is to, to set a line of communication which is out of the power projected by the US Navy. And uh, my understanding is that uh, uh, in many cases, uh, US policy uh, tries to, to, how to say, not to support the development of one belt, one road project. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, all of you. Thank you for this uh, beautiful session and uh, your um, wide experience that uh, was exposed uh, during this uh, meeting. And uh, just uh, due to our uh, uh, time with something that we always uh, don't have enough, uh, we will take a shorter break with uh, the permission of all of you and we shall return in 20 minutes uh, to uh, two o'clock um, I mean, uh, 1340 Israeli time, which is about uh, 20 minutes uh, all over the world. Uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for your active participation and insightful inputs. Uh, as uh, noted by uh, Major Saar, uh, the first professional session is it, uh, was uh, had its end and we invite you to enjoy a 20 minutes uh, tea break which actually uh, for the it will be um, the start of the uh, next session will be at uh, 5:15 india time pm and uh, 1:45 eastern european time which applies for the participants from bulgaria and uh, israel uh, at so please make sure you will be right back on time because uh, we'll start exactly with the time. Thank you very much. For the private and public sectors, including renowned law firms of the Bulgarian Embassy in Oslo and United Nations. Currently, she is an associate fellow at the IIMSR 
and advisor to Oslo Center for Peace and Human Rights. She has expertise in legal research and worked in the field of international criminal justice, migration, and human rights. Our second speaker is Mr. Ashwada Dube. He is an associate fellow at the National Maritime Foundation. He has acquired academic specialization in the domain of maritime law as he holds a degree LLM. He has gained experience in dealing with the mechanism of arbitration, mediation, and negotiation while working in reputed shipping company. As a maritime strategist, Ashwarya specializes in UNCLOS, San Remo Manual, SUA Convention, maritime terrorism, and underwater cables, privately armed security personnel, and floating armories. As a guest faculty, Ashwarya is involved with reputed university and institutions to share his knowledge and expertise of maritime law. We will have 12, 20 minutes of talk by our excellent speakers. Please post your questions in the chat box. Advocate Alexandra, you have the screen, please go ahead. Uh, hello, everybody, and thank you for having me today. It's a great, it's a great pleasure, pleasure, and uh, thank you for the nice introduction. So uh, without uh, taking any more of uh, the precious time that we have, I'm going to start with my presentations. And first, let me share my screen with you so you can have an idea of what I'm talking about, so you can have a visual. Um, <clears throat> Just a sec, share screen. Uh, is it, is it sharing? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. We cannot see your screen. Okay. You want, you want us to share, to share I mean, instead? Yes, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, so uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, migration law and maritime law in EU perspective. So uh, the most, uh, uh, the structure of my lecture is going to first answer very briefly the question. <laughs> Would everybody else please mute their mics? Thank you. So first, um, I'm very briefly going to answer a question of uh, what is a migration law, and then I'm going to cover some of the basic principles of migration law, and at the end, I'm going to see how these principles fit into maritime law perspective, and of course, the discussion would be with an eye towards the European practice. So uh, first, what is migration law? I really have to emphasize that there are two different directions of thinking of uh, when we start talking of migration law. The first one originates from the sovereignty perspective and the second one originates from a human rights perspective. And today we are going to be talking about the second one, the human rights perspective of migration law or the human rights of the individuals that are involved in the migration. So these two perspectives are very important. They, they do not all the time overlap. So that is why it is very important to have a basic understanding of the human rights perspective as well. So I would like to start with uh, one of the basic most important principles in migration law, it is so-called non-refoulement non principle. So uh, what is this principle? What does it mean? It basically means that states are not allowed to transfer individuals to uh, other places or other states if there is a danger for their safety. So <clears throat> this principle can be found basically in a, a lot of uh, human rights uh, conventions, including the UN Refugee Convention, the Convention Against Torture, also other regional conventions like the European Convention on Human Rights. 
Um, what is the interesting thing here that this is also customary law. So this means that is also uh, obligatory for states that are not parties to these conventions. And um, how did the European Court of Human Rights interpret this, uh, this principle? Of course, as a, a European Court of Human Rights in its interpretation, the court is striving to um, you know, broaden the human rights protection given to individuals. So it has over the years elaborated another concept called secondary reform. Uh, it basically means that not only are states uh, not allowed to transfer the individuals to dangerous countries, but also to countries that are considered safe, but there is a likelihood of being transferred to a third country that might not be safe. So uh, that's a very interesting twist uh, that we are going to further discuss as well. Uh, the second very uh, interesting principle is the prohibition for arbitrary and collective expulsion. So this is not universally accepted principle as the first one. Uh, it's very typical for the European uh, uh, law framework. It could be found in additional protocol four of the European Convention of uh, Human Rights. Um, <clears throat> What is the logic behind this prohibition, probably you would ask. The logic is that uh, each individual should be, is entitled to have his own personal case individually examined. And hence, if he has refusal to have the opportunity to challenge this refusal before court. And when states engage in collective expulsion, they presumably deprive individuals from this opportunity to have their case individually heard and examined. Here, it's a very interesting uh, case. It is called Hirsi versus Italy. Again, a case of the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, it is regarding interception of uh, refugees at sea. And here, the, call, uh, the court uh, adjudicates against Italy. Uh, uh, the court concludes that Italy has violated this prohibition by intercepting refugees at high seas and returning them to Libyan territory where they originally came from. So here we can see that this principle applies also extraterritorially in, in high seas, not only within the territory of the respective country. Uh, it is an interesting case. Maybe you can, uh, you can, uh, if you're interested, you can uh, take a look on it. It's uh, from 2012, I believe. Uh, second very interesting case is Claifia versus Italy. It is regarding uh, refugees from Tunisia, a group of men that crossed the Mediterranean Sea and uh, actually reached the shores of Lampedusa. Lampedusa is a small island in South Italy that is actually very close to Africa. And over the years, it has uh, experienced a um, high influx of uh, people trying to uh, reach European Union and they eventually end up in Lampedusa. As a result, the um, uh, the island is right now overcrowded with a lot of refugee centers inside. So these men, when they reached Lampedusa, in a couple of days, they were transferred back to Tunisia. And the explanation actually they received is that uh, they were transferred on the basis of bilateral agreement between Italy and Tunisia that the two countries concluded. Uh, after that, of course, the European Court of Human Rights um, adjudicated against Italy, saying that, uh, of course, states are uh, free to arrange whatever um, um, agreement or entry and exit of their respective countries, but these agreements should not be contrary to basic principles of human rights and migration law. And in this case, uh, this uh, agreement is contrary to the prohibition of arbitrary and collective expulsion because again, it deprives the individuals from opportunity to have their case examined.
individually. Uh, it, it is very interesting here that one of the uh, judges had a dissent opinion and he argued for a stricter interpretation of the prohibition of, of collective expulsion because of the grave difficulties of the practical implementation of this provision. Basically, the judge said that there is no overlapping between practice and theory and that it's not feasible for the states to implement the whole set of the human rights um, the human rights protection that are provided by the human rights instruments. Uh, unfortunately, states have yet to adopt a legal framework that uh, uh, is a good balance and a good compromise between theory and practice. This is yet to uh, achieve. So right now I'm going to move towards migration and maritime law and maybe see how some of those principles that we talked about, how they interplay in maritime law perspective. I would really like to talk a little bit about interception at sea. Uh, because there are a lot of gaps here that might be interesting, that might be of interest to you. So I'm not going to talk about the rights and the obligations of the masters of the ships and the rescue centers, because they're kind of clearly defined in the international um, in the international um, uh, maritime law conventions. Uh, basically, the masters of the ships, they are obliged to render assistance to people who are distressed at sea because, uh, of course, otherwise they are criminally liable according to domestic legislations of their respective states. So, uh, yeah, I'm not going into detail, detail here. What is interesting is what happens with the people who are already rescued, who are already intercepted by sea, who is responsible for those people. Um, so uh, as you know, the practice here is not unified, that gives some states a leeway to uh, negotiate their way out of responsibility or maybe to delay, even sometimes block disembarkation of the rescued people. So that is why it is very important to have like clearly defined, if not rules, at least procedures that are universally accepted. So it is universally accepted, probably most of you know that if people are intercepted in the territorial waters of, um, of a state, then the, the respective state has jurisdiction and hence responsibility over those people. But again, what happens if these people are intercepted in high seas? This is an interesting question. Again, we have a very well developed international practice that if these people are intercepted by state vessels and by state vessels, I mean, uh, uh, Navy vessels, um, uh, border control vessels and rescue security operation vessels, then it is considered again that of course the intercepted people are responsibility of, of, of this state. What happens if people though are intercepted but by private ships? Does this mean that we can apply the rule of the flag of the state? Well, yes and no, because uh, we don't have um, let's say universally accepted state practice. We have a lot of uh, uh, states that offer the so-called flag of convenience. So they have a higher likelihood of intercepting as they have more, uh, let's say vessels registered and flying under their flag. They have a higher chance of intercepting people with high seas. Hence, they would be less likely open to take responsibility for those people. So um, different states interpret uh, the rules here in a different way. That's why we have uh, United Nations guidance uh, by the United Nations High Commissioner of Human Rights that are recommended to be followed by the masters of ships, the states and the rescue centers when determining the most appropriate port of disembarkation. So one thing that is very important here is when determining this port of call is of crucial importance to take into consideration, first and foremost, the interest of the rescued people, second, policy, and uh, even sometimes law. So um, 
the UN uh, guidelines recommend to take the first closest geographical, geographically closest uh, port in cases when we have a lot of people who are rescued, like they're high in numbers, they have pressing needs of medical attention, accommodation, food, and if they stay for longer at the vessel that rescued them, this might be a danger to them and the crew that already rescued them. Then the UN recommends for them to, for, uh, for the ship to disembark at the closest port. So uh, there is also the chance to disembark at uh, the next scheduled port. And um, when is this appropriate? This is appropriate when the rescue, the number of rescue people is not so high, uh, their health condition is not pressing. So they can actually wait a little bit longer and uh, be um, uh, uh, disembarked and accommodated in the next Part of call. Of course, uh, if uh, rescued people have certain special needs that they cannot that cannot be uh, properly met in the next port of call or in the closest port of call, of course, this has to be some other port. But in any way, when um, uh, the master of the ship and the relevant rescue centers, when they're determining the most appropriate port of call, they have to take into consideration the non refoulement principle. And here is how human rights instruments and migration law interplays and, uh, and interfere with maritime law. For example, if um, the next port of call or the most appropriate port is not uh, represents danger for those people who claim refugee status. So this port should be avoided. So uh, of course that is done, that is like a very, very brief outline, but I think it's very interesting to hear, to see, because there are a lot of nuances and a lot of, as I said, room for interpretation. Uh, the fact that um, I mentioned guidelines does not uh, actually mean that state can derogate or not follow them. Because even though these provisions are not uh, uh, written codified law binding for all states, by not um, complying with them, they these states might violate other international obligations that they have. Like for example, the obligation to assist people distressed at sea. Uh, that uh, stems from maritime law or the, uh, the obligation uh, that stems from uh, international human rights law and the non refoulement principle, again, that we already mentioned. If they leave these people in high seas and uh, the ship sees itself forced to go to some place that is not considered safe, that means that the state that refused disembarkation actually uh, contributed to returning those people to unsafe place, hence violated the um, hence uh, violated the uh, non refoulement principle. So uh, this is like very, very brief outlining of the basic principles that we should be aware of when we talk about uh, uh, migration and maritime law. I really hope that you enjoy it and I really hope that you find this useful. Uh, thank you, Advocate Alexandra. Uh, now may I request uh, Mr. Ashwarya to present his point. Ashwarya, you have the screen. Thank you, sir. Sachin, could you please share the slide? Right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Eshwar Dube, and uh, I shall be presenting on the topic illegal migration from the sea. So let's begin. To give a brief overview of my presentation, I would be dealing with five aspects, namely the first one being definition of illegal migration according to International Organization for Migration, that is the IOM. Secondly, I will deal with India and how India deals with illegal migration. I will give certain examples in that regard. Also, the third aspect would be Indian efforts vis-a-vis helping migrants who come into India. The fourth one would be man-made disasters and legal migration. 
in this topic, I would be dealing with one of the very recent examples that has taken place uh, in the past six to eight months. And lastly, I would be talking about climate change and migration from the sea. Next slide. So what is illegal migration? As per the International Organization for Migration, illegal migrant and irregular migrant happen to be synonymous. And they are defined as someone who is who owing to illegal entry or the expiry of his or her visa lacks legal status in a transit or host country. The term applies to migrants who infringe a country's admission rules and any other person not authorized to remain in the host country. Now, when we deal with illegal migration, it is somewhat synonymous with irregular migration, and that is defined as a movement that takes place outside the regulatory norms of the sending, transit, and receiving country. From the perspective of, a de of destination countries, it is illegal entry, stay, or work in a country, meaning that the migrant does not have the necessary authorization or documents required under immigration regulations to enter, reside, or work in a country. Next slide, please. Now let's talk about India and its history with illegal migration. So India has always welcomed migrants with open arms. Let me tell you. India has always given shelter and protection to everyone who has sought help, whether through land or through the sea. And let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, India happens to be one of the biggest recipients of migrants in the world. Now, there would be a question in your mind as to why do we do all these things? Are we so good in our nature? The answer to that lies in a basic philosophy which is enshrined in our civilization, in our civilizational history, which is Vasudhaya Kutumbakam, which stands for the word, the phrase, the world is one family, ladies and gentlemen. So that is why we do what we do. Next slide, please. Now let's talk about Indian efforts vis-a-vis -vis illegal migration. So I would be dealing with four specific examples wherein India outshone everyone else vis-a-vis -vis regard helping illegal migrants. So first, I would be talking about the conflict in use illegal migration which was, uh, which take took place due to the India-Pakistan war of 1971. Then I would be dealing with the humanitarian relief and rescue, which was conducted by the Indian agencies uh, in, the in the aftermath of the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. Next, I would be dealing with conflict-induced illegal migration from the sea. That is what took place when the Sri Lankan civil war uh, happen. And lastly, I would be dealing with climate change induced migration. A specific example in that regard would be the case of the country of Maldives. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the India Pakistan war. The reason why this war was fought was the simple reason that the native population of East Pakistan, which is now known as Bangladesh, they were being vehemently persecuted by the East Pakistani military. There was loot, there was arson, there was rape all around. And that witnessed an influx of approximately 11 million East Pakistani illegal migrants into India. The Prime Minister at that point of time, Mrs. Indra Gandhi, took the decision of taking the matter into her own hands. And let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, this this was reported as the single largest displacement of refugees in the second half of the 20th century by the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. What is astounding to know is the fact that approximately 1.5 million East Pakistani, now Bangladeshi, illegal migrants still reside in India. They still live in India and they still work in India and the country, the government of India allows that. Next slide, please. So now let's talk about another example, the 2004 Indian Ocean Tsunami. So on the 26th of December, 2004, a massive earthquake struck 
off the west coast of Sumatra, which is Indonesia. As a result of that, a devastating series of tsunamis struck the literal state of the Indian Ocean. However, the unperturbed the government of India sprung into action immediately. The Indian Navy and the Indian Air Force immediately sprung into action within an hour of the tsunami striking the east coast of India. Ladies and gentlemen, the Indian Navy reached the affected areas of Sri Lanka within two hours. Within two hours of the disaster, with food supplies, medicines, and other essential provisions. Next slide. The Indian Navy's role needs to, needs to be commended in this regard, wherein the Indian Navy divers played a critical role in clearing the approaches to the channels to Sri Lankan ports to enable civilian boats and ships to come and join the rescue effort. Also, let me tell you, that Indian agencies provided relief materials, carried out effective rehabilitation of the victims, and helped rebuild societies in the affected countries of Sri Lanka, Indonesia, and other Southeast Asian nations. So what effect did it produce? This prevented a mass exodus of people from the coastal areas of the affected countries to areas which were relatively safer from such calamities that is preventing illegal migration. Next slide, please. Now let's talk about the Sri Lankan civil war, which almost everyone in the world will be knowing about. It was a humanitarian crisis which spanned over 26 years. So the government of India provides monetary assistance, food, clothing, shelter, and health facilities to approximately 89,000 Sri Lankan migrants living in one, 132 refugee camps in India. Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, the influx of refugees coming from Sri Lanka to India was massive. I cannot describe it in words. Let me put it in figures. Close to 0.5 million refugees came into India. Some of them willingly repatriated, some of them stayed back, and they're still residing in India. And even large amounts of refugees have willingly returned to Sri Lanka without being, re without being forced to repatriate. And with that, we can tell you that we stand by and abide by international law. So actions such as these clearly establish the reputation of India as a responsible country, which does not shy away from helping migrants. Next slide, please. So let's talk about migrants and Maldives. Maldives is our neighbor, and Maldives is facing an existential threat from rising sea levels, which is a direct consequence of climate change. Now let me tell you about certain factors which come into play while uh, Maldives is facing this existential threat. The average elevation, ladies and gentlemen, of the island, the Maldivian island, is 1.5 meters above the sea level. So they are very low lying and they are staring at an existential threat right in their faces. The sources of fresh water are shrinking each year. How will they drink? How will they prepare their food? And more importantly, the intensity of climate induced diseases such as dengue and crib typhus has increased substantially in the archipelago. Next slide, please. So now the Maldivian nationals are migrating to various countries, be it India, Sri Lanka, or the literal states of the Indian Ocean, in search for a safe haven. Approximately 5,000 Maldivian nationals live in the Indian states of Kerala, Karnataka, and Tamil Nadu. They are the southern states of India, and approximately 5,000 people are living out there. The government of India provides them food, clothing, shelter, and requisite medical assistance, ladies and gentlemen, without asking for anything in return. Next slide, please. Now let us talk about a recent disaster, a man-made disaster, which has brought a lot of people at the brink of illegal migration. So as you can see in the picture, in July 2020, the MD Wakashio, it's a merchant vessel. It ran aground and started spilling oil 
off the coast of Mauritius. By August 2020, the vessel had discharged more than 1,000 tons of oil on the east coast of Mauritius. Next slide. So by August 2020, as you can see in the picture, it broke apart into two. By the time the salvos came to the rescue, the damage had already been done. By the government's estimate, that is the Maldivian government's estimate, it is the worst maritime disaster in the history of Mauritius. Also, local people are badly affected by, by this disaster because fishing and tourism are the main sources of livelihood in, in Mauritius. Now that has brought an imminent threat of mass exodus, mass exodus of local people. We are staring illegal migration right in the eye. We need to act on it. Next slide, please. Now, time again, there are questions which have been answered, which have been asked by the international community, such as, why isn't India signing the Refugee Convention? I cannot give a definite answer to that. Let me tell you. But as the saying goes, actions speak louder than words. And certainly India's actions have proved that we are helping illegal migrants. The second question which people ask, what are the legal ramifications of such migration related issues? The other question being, why aren't international bodies doing enough for people claiming political asylum in different countries? Now, my point is, why cannot we shift our focus I'm not saying dilute our focus, but shift our focus to certain questions which can be that what can be done to prevent coastal populations from migrating to other areas? How can we reduce the impact of climate change on coastal populations across the globe? And why aren't international bodies doing enough for islanders seeking refuge in different countries? These are points which we should definitely look into. Next slide, please. Now let's talk about climate change induced illegal migration from the sea. Next slide. So when we talk about climate change, we always visualize certain factors which come into play, namely rapidly rising sea levels, the rising population across the globe, and the, the stress it is producing on the natural resources, also, the other aspect being the wide ranging disparity between brown economy, which is a land based economy, and blue economy, which is a sea based economy. So, there are wide ranging disparities between both of them. And as we all are suffering from it, frequent recurrence of natural calamity. Next slide, please. So, there are certain questions which I would pose in front of all of you. Please reflect on it so that probably tomorrow we can come with some answers to these questions. First question being, why aren't international bodies doing enough, as I'd already mentioned? Why aren't they doing enough for island people seeking refuge in different countries? Second, what can be done to prevent coastal populations from migrating to other paper areas? Third question, how can we reduce the impact of climate change on coastal populations across the globe? And lastly, how can we reduce the disparities between the brown economy and the blue economy worldwide? So with these questions in mind, I would now like to come to the end of my presentation. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your time. It was a pleasure. Uh, thank you, Advocate Alexandra and Ashwarya for sharing your thoughts and explaining the concept of migration, the EU and Indian perspective, and also highlighting some very pertinent questions. I also thank everyone for the wholehearted participation. I have noted your questions, which we'll discuss tomorrow after completion of session two. Over to Mr. Satyam for rest of the day's proceeding. Thank you so much, uh, Commander Anand. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are at 1750 Indian Standard Time. And as indicated earlier, We'll wind up the day one now. We'll resume the second session tomorrow at 14.30 Indian Standard Time. 
which would be 11 m eastern european on behalf of the national maritime foundation and the imsr i thank you all for taking your time in participating on today's program tomorrow we'll continue this uh, important discussion on that and and also to cover some aspects of security maritime cyber development artificial intelligence etc looking forward to your participation please block the timings and we'll see you tomorrow thank you so much thank you very much thank you very much we'll see you tomorrow thank you al have a good day and to everybody as well thank you very much good evening india <laughs> good evening thank you all <laughs>